I would like to call this meeting to order. Before we get started, let's introduce everyone on this meeting. I'm Sandy Brock. When I call your name, please confirm that you can hear me um, by verifying that you are present. I'm going to start with the commissioners. Uh, Jonathan. Present. Thank you. Um, Patrick. Here. Thank you. Uh, Alicia is not here and Betsy is sick. Okay. So let's go with staff. Uh, Leah, our agent. I'm here. And uh, Jan, our assistant. I'm here. Thank you very much. We'll go through the speakers if you happen to, excuse me. Ugh. Okay. <laughs> we'll go through our speakers uh, for 105 uh, Millbury Street, uh, Anthony LeMay. If you can hear us, uh, doesn't look like he's on yet, right? Correct, and he said that he's traveling. He might have connectivity issues, but it is the school department, so if need be, I can speak to that one. All right, thank you very much. Uh, 200 uh, Westboro Road, uh, Peter Barkham, Andrew Gordon, and Reagan. Uh, you, who's on, as I see Peter, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. And Andrew Gorman is on as well. Regan will not be able to join us this evening, but she'll be listening in. And we also have uh, Jean Poteet listening in as an attendee. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, 45 Creeper Hill Road is Scott Morrison. Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Scott. Uh, 100 Westboro Road is Essek Petrie. Petri. Hey, how's it going? I don't know why I'm showing up as Mark on my screen, but uh, Mark, I believe, is here as well. And uh, I can hear you just fine. All right. Thank you very much. Did I actually get your name right this time? You nailed it. I, I didn't. I was just going to let it slide and then it rolled right off. It was smooth, Sandra. Thank you. Oh, it only took how many meetings? We're getting it, though. We're getting <laughs> it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And uh, you said Matt is on also? Uh, oh, Mark is Matt, also on. Matt will be joining uh, later um, as well as we are on around 8, 815. All right. So, sounds great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, this open meeting of the Conservation Commission is being conducted remotely via Zoom pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order as extended on June 15th, 2021, February 12th, 2022, and July 16th of 2022. Access information for public for the public has been provided on the town website. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. Please remember to mute your phone and computer when you're not speaking. If you're using a dial in by telephone feature, you can mute yourself by pressing star six. As chair, I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. Please note uh, you will not have screen sharing privileges, uh, but staff can easily uh, display any visuals per your queue. After speakers conclude their remarks, I will invite each commissioner by name to provide any comments, questions, or motions. After the commissions have, uh, have spoken, I will allow public comments to be spoken by participants. Participants must use the raise hand feature by clicking on the hand icon at the bottom right of the Zoom menu bar to indicate they would like to speak. If you're using a dial in by telephone feature, please press star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute when you are called on. Participants who raise their hand will be recognized one at a time by their name and then will be promoted to speak. Public comments will be followed by commission and applicant res responses. Finally, each vote taken will be conducted by roll call vote. As a reminder, commission is concerned with the state and town wetlands and stormwater regulations. Concerns outside this purview need to be addressed by the appropriate boards. For example, road condition must be addressed by select board. Traffic concerns must be addressed uh, with the planning board. All right. Seeing that it is 7.09, Leah, anything that we can uh, do for action items before our first public hearing? Um, trying to pick out the easy ones. Meeting minutes is quick. Okay. Um, so to the commissioners, uh, hopefully everyone has had a chance to, to read them. If you have any comments or questions on them, uh, uh, please let me know. I'll do a quick roll call vote on this. Uh, Patrick, any co comments or questions? No. And Jonathan? Nope. Uh, do I have a motion? Motion to accept the meeting minutes from July. June. June 14th. Yeah, do I have a second? second. We have a motion a second. Roll call vote, Patrick. Yes. Jonathan. Yes. 
I am also a yes, and that motion carries. Okay. Um, trying to think of what fits in a couple minutes here. Um, we had a discussion item that I have a feeling you guys might want to table till others are here, but we just need to have our annual discussion about possibly reorganizing the commission or keeping as is. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that tonight or circle back around to it. Uh, we can circle back around to it, but I am certainly open for anyone else who's looking to step up to a different uh, responsibility on the commission. But we can talk about that later on. Okay. Tonight or another night? Uh, let's let's just check on um, the time. And if it gets late, uh, we can uh, have it in the August meeting. Okay. Um, I don't know if I have something to fit into two minutes. Okay, well, we'll kind of hang for two minutes then. Actually, I suppose if you want to do 114 Merriam Road, second action item. Okay. Uh, so um, a report on 114 Merriam Road, sure. minor change request. Right. I don't think anyone's here for this, um, but if they are, they can raise their hand if they want. Um, so this 114 Merriam Road is now a few single family houses. Um, they're just requesting a change in their approved plans to capture the water into drop inlets instead of head walls. I did chat with Jeff from Graves Engineering about this. He had no issue with it. Um, I don't know if you guys have any questions or anything but I recommended approving the minor change. Yeah, no, I, I, I read that earlier and took a look at it. I don't have any issues. Uh, quick roll call, Patrick, anything, any comments or questions on that one? No. Uh, Jonathan? No. Okay, do I have a motion? Uh, I motion to approve the minor change for 114 Merit Road. Second? Second. We have a motion to second, roll call vote, Patrick? Yes. Jonathan? Yes. I am also a yes, the motion passes. One minute and counting, okay. Slide up to this one. I could tell a joke. You could. Go for it. <laughs> I don't think anyone will laugh. I don't really know any jokes. I just thought I'd say a joke for a joke. So bring the cat back out. <laughs> the cats, oh, the cats. Oh, there's the cat. It's like, wait, well, you're changing the desktop here. He's, he's playing. Now he's going to play with it. So if you see the, uh, the camera go flying, it's because I introduced him to it. And he's actually, yep, there he goes. <laughs> He's now biting the little little legs on the camera. Look what I okay. started. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um. I did tell you that. All right. I need to give him something else. Okay. Look at that. 715. Let's rock and roll. Pursuant to the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act and the Grafton Wetlands Protection Bylaw, the Grafton Conservation Commission will hold public hearing uh, to act upon a request for determination of applicability for the construction of a handicap and visitor parking at 105 Millbury Street in Grafton. I think, um, Leah, you already mentioned that this is the school department and is, are they here or would you just like to take it? Um, there was a phone number that I thought might be Tony, but they just dropped off. I know he said he might have connectivity issues, so I can speak to it. I'll give Jan a second to pull the plan up. Okay. Okay, so they are just looking to add a few parking spaces out in front of um, the Millbury Street Elementary School as shown in the dark gray box. Um, so they are, I think, can't exactly read that number, but I believe it was around 60 or so feet away from the wetland out front. 
Um, I did ask them what they intend to do with any runoff, and they are going to be pitching this parking towards their existing um, basin for stormwater purposes. So I didn't really have anything else other than um, a special condition that they use the erosion control as they outlined in their application. Okay. Um, and so this is an RDA. Um, yeah. my, only, my only concern, how steep is that slope down to the uh, basin? Um, if I can bug Jan to pull up GIS and turn on Topo, if we can get that answer. So yeah, because my only my only um, and it's it's my only concern is if there's erosion because when you concentrate uh, the discharge from a pavement like that, you may end up with some erosion. Um, it, it depends upon how flat it is where they discharge and how they can spread it out. So I certainly don't have any issue. I don't think this needs, um, I don't think this needs to go to a notice of intent. I just think um, they need to be aware of that. And, and if there is a problem, they need to, you know, put uh, either stone or riprap so to, to prevent any erosion. Okay. That, that's really it. And yeah, that's my only concern. So I'll do a quick roll call to see if anyone else has questions. So Patrick. No, I don't have anything on that. Uh, Jonathan. No, uh, Sandy, you hit on mine, which was if it's pitched and it's just solid asphalt or something, how it um, would impact the wetland, but doesn't, it's, it's far enough away. And again, as long as they are considerate of where that is going, I, I don't have any issue with it. Yeah, I, I think there's a long enough travel distance over vegetation um, that that's probably a better treatment train than, you know, putting in a deep sump catch basin or something. But yeah, as long as they control any kind of erosive erosion conditions that is created from this concentration, and that can that can be done with a simple stone or, or you know, four to eight inch stone. So that's fairly simple solution. All right, so I will open this up to the public to see if anyone has any comments or questions on 105 Millbury. I'll just kind of hang out for just a moment to see if anyone raises their hand. At the same time, someone can prepare the motion in their head. And why don't we move along with the motion? Um. Motion to issue the negative determination with the condition that the erosion control will be utilized as noted in the application. Second. Second. Roll call vote, Patrick. Yes. Jonathan. Yes. And I am also a yes, the motion carries. So the next, uh, the next one, 200 Westboro Road is at Tufts. This is when I have to step aside and recuse myself, the company I work for, we do a lot of work for Tufts and, um, and I am a part owner of that company. So I need to step aside. So. Uh, but that's in 11 minutes. So could we tackle some stuff in the meantime? Oh, brilliant. Jonathan, you are brilliant and watching the clock. Thank you. Yes, we absolutely can do um, some. <laughs> yes, we can do some action items. I know there's a couple of, um, Certificate of compliance, we could probably get through, right? Sure. Um, if you guys want to skip to the fourth action item, uh, is a request for certificate of compliance for 69 Sunrise Avenue. Um, we do have the homeowner on the call tonight. Um, 
she wanted to discuss with the commission the required no disturbed signage. Uh, that was the only condition that I saw uh, as outstanding. Otherwise, everything else was met, but that signage has not been installed. Okay. Uh, can you bring that person up? Here she is now. If you I could am just, sorry, I'm yeah, if you could just give your name and address for the record, please. Erica Schoenberg Alv, 69 Sunrise Ave. And sure. So we have a standard uh, condition that we require uh, small signs um, in areas, especially our 25 foot no disturb sign. So people don't um, alter that area or dump in it or anything else. Um, if you want to let me know what your kind of uh, question is, happy to kind of uh, answer it. So I'm not aware of like anybody else on the same pond having to have this requirement. Like we do have fencing along the vegetation so that there's no way that um, anybody who comes to my home can disturb. But there is like a, a area where there is no vegetation. It just is a drop down to the pond. And so my question is like, do, do I need to have the signage there when it's clear that it's wetlands? Like it says wetlands, no disturb. And it's not clear what exactly that means because there's boating, ice fishing, motorized boats, all on that pond and on the on the opposite side directly opposite me there's a public boat launch and there's no such signage there so so basically in this this kind of condition and this kind of policy to put the signs up have been around for a while but unless you have come in front of the commission you may not be subject to it just because you haven't done any work and this is for a bordering vegetative wetlands. We have a, a local bylaw that requires 25 foot no disturb. And basically we want that marked because we have found um, and we continue to find people alter that. Now, if you have a fence at the vegetation line, if that's where this, and if that was the signage was supposed to go, you can just simply attach the signs to the fence. We're not worried about what you're doing because you're aware of it. We're worried about the next homeowner or someone else. So it's it's really, um, it's a way for us to notify people um, so they do not do things because you'd be surprised. We'll have um, homeowners come in who have filled the wetlands and just didn't know. As far as what is a wetlands, that is what is as defined uh, under the state regulations and under our local zoning. So there's um, a, a legal reference of what that definition is and happy to share you that with you. It has to do with the vegetation, um, the soils and the hydrology. Now, when you're talking about, when you're talking about a pond where there's boating and, and other activities, that pond is technically, um, is technically land underwater and that's the resource area. And even the activities there are regulated, but there's also a lot of approved um, uses such as boating and things like that. So that's, there's no issue with that activity. What we're concerned with is the alteration of that bordering vegetated wetlands. And that's what that sign is for. So um, it's pretty standard. It goes in, into all of our, um, you know, orders of conditions. Now we don't want this to make this onerous or change your yard or anything else. What we want to do is that, um, not that, I don't know if you're going to sell the property or not, doesn't matter so that the next person in knows that, hey, what does this mean? And hopefully they just call us before they do any work. You know, the fact that you came to us, you're, you're more aware of what those wetlands are. Um, I don't know if there's something else I can kind of explain to it. We're talking, Leah, they're four by four inches. Yeah. Or so they're small signs and it's really yeah. just about, you know, making sure there's notification about that in case someone who's doing your lawn comes in and starts dumping lawn clippings or something else, there's a sign. Now a sign may not stop everyone, but a sign is the best that we can do. I, I do my lawn, but so what you're saying is if I have these four by four signs attached to the fence, that's fine. I don't have to disrupt my view of the water where there is no vegetation. Uh, so if it's I to can... protect the vegetation. The if bordering I... vegetated wetlands, yeah. Sandy, if I can just sure. put in for a second. Um, if Jan can pull up one of the photos that were provided, just so we can point out what's being referred to as the fence. Uh, 
Oh, that's just of the fence. Um, there's another one that shows the. So you can see there's like a whole section next to my adjacent to my driveway. There is no vegetation. It's just a retaining wall and Fisherville Pond. So okay. do I have to put signs there and disrupt the view? Or uh, is it sufficient to put them along the fence? So and make let, it clear let, that you can't do anything. Yeah, so let, let's go back to what the order of condition says. So <laughs> what was the spacing, Leah, every 25, every 50 feet? It was every 20 and okay. it was along the vegetation, but you can see there's no vegetation there. Please don't tell my daughter I shared this photo publicly. <laughs> we will not say anything and we will not mention the fact that this is recorded. Um, uh, can you bring up the plan, Leah? I'll leave that to Jan, she's driving the bus. Yep. Okay. So the disturbance like for the construction was actually over the driveway. So the area where there is no vegetation and it, it was actually previously disturbed ground. That's why it was approved. Right, yeah, yeah. Obviously there's no issues with the work that was done and so forth. That's not really what this discussion's about, but I'm just trying to think of something where um, during this informal discussion that we could you know, increase the spacing or something um, along with that retaining wall is so. Because um, most people who come to my house that will see the signs will just think I'm being ironic because clearly there's wetlands. I, I get it, but it, 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 we try to be uniform in how we apply it and so forth. Um, Leo, what about uh, fixing the sign to the retaining wall? Like flat on the ground? Either flat on the ground on uh, all on the other side. On the other side, there is like, it is like a, a three foot wall. Yep. So there would be a surface to attach it to. I mean, I don't think anyone's going to notice on the other side, but on top of the- The voters would notice, but wall. not. <laughs> the, yeah. Yeah. Well, what about just if there's, if it's a, is it a, a, a wooden or timber retaining wall? It's wood. So uh, what about just laying it flat on the top? Then okay. you're not obstructing it. And then it's, you know, it's still four by four. So someone may see it, but it, it's not sticking up in the air. I understand what you're saying. And really, this is this is our way to inform people. And yeah, we get it. You're on a pond. You, know, you should know that it's a wetlands and so forth. You'd be surprised what people do, not out of, you know, spite or intent by out of um, ignorance. And, and that's why they're there. So um, Leo, right about, uh, I'll check, well, well, I do this, I'll check with Patrick and Jonathan. Patrick, what do you think about just having the signs flush on the top? So at least if someone's doing something, you can, you can see it. Yeah, I mean, if that works for, I, I would think that that would work just as well. So I don't have any issue with it. Uh, Jonathan. Sounds fine to me. Okay. So are uh, there particular signs that we need to obtain and do you have recommendation on where to get them? Yes, the answer to that is yes. And we have a local sign maker that does them. So they usually have them in, you know, Leah, they usually have them in stock. I believe so, yeah. Yeah, okay. uh, and you can reach out to uh, the office during the day and they'll, they'll give you all the information on the sign company and so forth. So we're trying to make these so that people see them, but they're not over, you know, this, this huge sign is it's supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to make people ask what, why are they here? And so they actually call us. That's the intent of the sign. It's not okay. intended to obscure your, your view of, of the lake or the pond, I should say, that's not the intent. So do we need to do a quick vote, Leah, on a minor change or is this, this discussion sufficient? I think this is fine. We just need to note that we're um, rescheduling the COC request then to, to August to wait for this to be done. Okay. So, it, uh, so um, 
Erica, how does that sign? How does that sound with just being able to put the signs right on the flat on, where, where it's a retaining wall? Yeah, that's that's fine. And then on, affix it to the fences on either side is sufficient yeah. too. And then and not in a kind of obscure way, but that so it's visible. Correct. Yep. Okay. You um, know, just like, make it higher than the grass. I mean, it's not, I mean. Yeah, no, 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 of course. Yeah. I just will, I like on that white fence that you saw in the pictures and like enclosing my pool. So I don't want to, you know, necessarily have it be an eyesore, but I can certainly fix it to the top of the fence in, a, in an area where it's visible, but not like. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds fine. And once you see the signs, you'll see how they're, they're not. Oh, I have seen them. I looked them up. Okay. I just wasn't sure how to get them. Yep. No, well, yeah. Uh, either Jan or, or Leah can certainly help you with that and get you the details and who to contact. So. And Sandy. if this is being yep. continued to the August meeting, when is that? Go ahead, so Leah. August, August 16th. Is it possible for it to be September? I'm moving a child into University of Miami on August 16th. Yeah, that's absolutely no problem at all. Okay, so September. Okay, yep. great. Anything else, Leah, on this? Yeah, I was just going to clarify, I think. So when she's talking about the white fence, which you can see surrounding the pool on this plan, I don't believe any need to go there. They just need to go along the retaining wall along the pond. Oh, okay. Okay. So even easier. <laughs> and, and, so, and so what I would do is, uh, you, know, uh, you know, whether it's tomorrow or some other time during uh, the week, just reach out to Leah and she can actually explain and show you where those signs need to go. So if you don't okay. need to put them on the white fence, we don't want you to put them in places you don't need them. Okay, great. So. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks. If you have any other questions, please feel free uh, to reach out to our staff. So. All right. Thank you very much. All right. You're welcome. Bye. All right. Next. We need to, do we need to continue that? Or is it rescheduled? Noting it being rescheduled is fine. It's not a it's not a public hearing, so you don't have yeah. to do a continuance. Thank you. All right. So seeing that it's seven thirty three, uh, we can go ahead with two hundred Westboro Road. And as I started to say before, Jonathan pointed out to me we could actually do other work. Um, I need to recuse my, recuse myself uh, from any projects with Tufts. So. Okay. Uh, I'll keep the video on so I can watch you, but I'm going to turn my video and my mute uh, and mute myself. So thank you. So Jonathan or Patrick, if you're Who able wants to, to pull yeah. up the lead sheet, that's where Sandy reads the legal ad off of. All right. Thanks all. You want to take it, John, or do you want me to? I'm just trying to open right now, but if you've got it open, go ahead. Sure. Well, I, have a, I just got it open. Um, so pursuant to the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act and the Grafton Wetlands Protection Bylaw, the Grafton Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, July 19th at 7.30 in conference room F, second floor at 30 Providence Room. Road, Grafton, Massachusetts, and via Zoom to act upon a request for determination of applicability for paving and utility installation for a trailer at 200 Westboro Road, Grafton, Massachusetts. Um, I don't have to read the rest of that right, Leah. Nope, you're good. Okay. So, what's we talked about? Has this one come up before? I'm trying to remember. No, nope. uh, if sorry. No, nope. go ahead. Uh, if if I may, uh, members of the commission, Andrew Gorman from Beals and Thomas here on behalf of CB Set, as you mentioned earlier, Peter Markham is also with us this evening. Um, this is the first time the commission is hearing this project. We are seeking a deter negative determination of applicability to proceed with uh, new paving installation as well as um, some utility work within a site that has jurisdictional wetlands for. The entirety of our site work that involves earth disturbing activities were actually outside of the 100 foot buffer zone. Um, Leah, is it okay for me to screen share or do you prefer to share the plan? Um, so I'll, I'll pull it up for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
Thank you. So north is the left side of the plan and to the west, which is the bottom of the screen, is Discovery Drive. The site is accessed from Yorkshire Lane, which is the perpendicular to Discovery Drive. Um, we are seeking to install new paving, again, outside of the 100-foot buffer zone, which will house two new MRI trailers for the university and CV sets work with the swine facility. Again, so we're outside of the 100-foot buffer zone, and we also have demarcated a designated soil stockpile area outside of the 100-foot buffer zone. We don't anticipate that this is a type of project that will require much earthwork, but we do have to achieve that gravel base. So there's going to be some material moved around on site. Um, and again, uh, the only activity site work that is going to be within the buffer zone itself, there is an existing parking lot um, and there's going to be some repainting of those stripes. Um, if we zoom into the plan right where the uh, parking area intersects with the proposed paving, we have some restriping proposed. But again, um, that's really the only thing that's going to be inside the 100 foot, and that's just a you know bucket and paintbrush type of exercise. We're able to confine the land disturbing activities outside of the buffer. And I would like to open it to the commissioners for any questions. And um, say, so Jonathan, do you have any questions or concerns? No, I, it seems like all the work is really taking place outside the buffer. So I, I don't have any concerns with the activity. Yeah, that was my only question. Um, it sounds like uh, pretty much all the work is outside there. Le Leah, is there anything else we should know on this one? No, I don't have anything to add. I was just going to recommend issuing a negative determination, um, confirming that the area is outside of jurisdiction. So Leah, I guess my only question there would be if there is line striping on the existing paving, does that impact anything that we we see in the in the report? Nope. Okay. Um, do we need to open it up for the public as well? Yes, please. Yeah, so let's open up to the public. We'll give it a few minutes. Um, if anyone has any comments, any attendees, please raise your hand and we can promote you or try to give it a minute. Give Sandy time to get some chores done. Get the cat away from the camera. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> if I may ask one uh, follow-up question, um, just in terms of voting quorum tonight, I do notice that we're down to two commissioners. Is that the, the quorum for the size of the board? I just wanted to make sure, yep. Yeah, yeah, because we have, um, well, do you want to probably explain it better, Leah? Sure, um, so as long as a majority of those present at the meeting votes okay. to approve or deny, uh, you're good to go. So it covers the ability to have a recusal. So as long okay. as they both vote the same, you're, you're all set. I appreciate the clarification. So given that we haven't heard, uh, and this seems pretty straightforward to me as well. Um, so given that we haven't heard from anyone in the public, uh, do I have a motion? Yes, I'd like to make a motion um, for 200 Westboro Road uh, to close the hearing and issue a negative determination stating that the area is outside the uh, jurisdiction uh, I'll second that. Um, Jonathan, how do you vote? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Motion carries. Motion passes. Uh, we should be all set. All right. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. And while Sandy is away, before we call her back, we have an action item for another party involved in us. Um, if you want to handle that. Sure. Okay, so that would be our third action item on the list. It's a usage authorization request um, for usage of conservation land. 
It was submitted by Chris Whittier of Tufts. He's looking to um, do some live capture and sampling of squirrels and water snakes um, with his students on a handful of our properties. Um, and my only other note was one of the properties he wants to do this work on is 25 Willard um, Street or Road, I, I can't remember which, um, but it's Axtell Forest. Technically that one's Town of Grafton in general, not ConCom specific, but I figured we have this approval process set up and I don't believe any other entity in town does. So I was okay just wrapping it in um, because it is open space. It's just not specifically under our care. So as long as you guys are comfortable with that, I recommend approving his application. Okay. I think we've done this one in the past, haven't we? Yeah, I think it's a, a, about an annual or, or every other year thing that he does. Yeah. Um, John, do you have any comments, concerns, questions, anything? No, it, it's, it seems pretty straightforward. So I, I don't have any concerns and I don't have any comments. Yeah, and we've done it in the past and um, seems to make sense. Don't think we need to open this one to the public, okay. but anyway. Um, so, I'll make a motion to approve the conservation land usage for 25 Willard Street and others for wildlife research. I'll second that. And um, John, how do you vote? Uh, before we jump there, Lee, do I have to list off at all the places or is it enough because it's in the notes and everything? Right, you're all set. Okay, um, I vote yes. Uh, I vote yes as well, so motion passes. All right, now we have to get Sandy back. I'm hoping she just shut her camera off and is wandering around. But Sandy, can you hear us? We all have to wave. Hello, Sandy. That's how I, I've learned that on Zoom, that's how you say or you cheer and clap as you do this. Sorry about that. I was sure, uh, sure, sure. doing something else, and then I looked up and I see three people waving. <laughs> Sorry about that. It worked. <laughs> it did. It certainly did work. So okay, all right. So we're so that's all set. Yeah, we took care of Tufts action item as well, so you didn't have to leave again. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. So now it's uh, one minute to seven forty-five, and we can start forty-five Creeper Hill Road. Yep. Okay. A minute can seem very long, can it not? The uncomfortable cool. silence. Here we go. At least, it, at least it cooled off out there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, today was gorgeous. Today was gorgeous. Was All right. Too. Seeing that it is 745, uh, pursuant to the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act and the Grafton Wetlands Protection Bylaw, um, the Grafton Conservation Commission uh, will, uh, will act upon a notice of intent application for Grafton Wetland Protection Bylaw for the construction of a single family house at 45 Creeper Hill Road. Okay, and Scott Morrison is here to discuss it. So yes. you're up. Good evening. Um, can I share my screen? It's possible to share a screen or can we show the plan up on the screen, whatever you prefer? I'll pull the plan up for you. Okay. So just to kind of give you the, the background on this particular project, um, if you recall, um, file a notice of intent back in October 14th of 2021 for this proposed project. Public hearing was closed on November 16th and then order of conditions issued on November 30th. At that time, um, the driveway was actually within an easement on the adjacent property um, that necessitated a zoning variance application, which was made 
on November 10th of 2021, and it was ultimately denied on March 24th of 2021. So the ZBA won't, will not allow the, uh, the driveway to be within the easement. It must remain on the uh, site itself. So I prepared a new notice of intent application. Um, also concurrently, I believe that, you know, really what should be filed is a, an amendment request because it's, we've already got the approval for essentially the back half. So the, the proposed house, driveway, um, everything essentially from the, uh, that cross culvert that you see kind of with a, the driveway bends off the uh, Creep Hill Road um, has already been approved. So the approved plan showed um, it was riprap side slopes um, during the ZBA process. Uh, um, Jeff Walsh from Graves Engineering conducted a review. He suggested flattening the grades out for the site at, rather than have the one-to-one -one riprap slope. They're two-to-one uh, grass slopes along with a retaining wall along the wetland side or the, I guess it's the, I guess the page south um, of the, the access coming in. So there'll be a, a short four foot retaining wall um, along the, the, um, the driveway to, to minimize the grades into bordering land subject to flooding and the uh, border and vegetated wetland. So the current driveway as shown meets the zoning requirements. Um, the only other plan change was, there was a letter of map amendment um, that's, so a letter of map amendment from FEMA, which provides a, an elevation for 27 Faulkner Road, which is on Flint Pond, which is upgrading of the site. It's both upgrading of the bridge at Creeper Hill Road, as well as the, the uh, Flint Pond Dam. So it would be upgrading of that. Provides an elevation of uh, 359.2, um, which is consistent with the city of Worcester it uses 358.82, which is slightly lower than that. And the town of Shrewsbury uses 358.6 for Lake Quinsigamond and, and Flint Pond. So all those elevations are upgrading of this proposed site. So the original impacts approved by the commission were 3,450 square feet of bordering land subject to flooding, which would provide compensatory flood storage, which required quite some extensive grading. Um, the currently proposed is 300 uh, square feet of BLSF impact and uh, 264 square feet of bordering vegetated wetland where there was none uh, proposed before. Essentially, a driveway is going to shift onto the property, which resulted in, in a, a kind of a wetland impact, um, bordering vegetated wetland impact to, to get onto the site. So really, the, the only plan change from the originally approved project is the access driveway. Um, coming in off the road, the, the house and the driveway beyond that point remains the same. The other thing that changed was the wetland replication area. If you look in the, the bottom portion of the site, we've got a bordering vegetated wetland uh, replication area and bordering land subject to flooding compensatory flood storage area that's, that's being proposed there. Um, and the other thing is it's located within riverfront area. It's an old lot, it was created back in the 80s, so it's well before August 7th, 1996. So based upon the current Wealth Protection Act regulations, the commission shall allow the construction of a single family house on the proposed project site. So we're proposing a erosion control barrier consisting of entrenched silt fence and straw wattles surrounding the project as a limit of work and, and demarcation of the limit of uh, disturbance proposed. Again, it's relatively pretty straightforward. We've uh, obtained an order before for this. Um, so what would, I would expect to happen would be, you know, presume, assuming the Conservation Commission issues an order of conditions for this, approving this particular project in this configuration, we'd simply come back with a request for certificate of compliance, closing out the old order and, and closing that out based upon lack of any action on that. So. At this point, I'd be happy to answer questions if the commission has any. All right, uh, thank you. So uh, I had just one question, Leah. Is there any reason why we couldn't? I'm just trying to, I'm just thinking about we have an outstanding order out there. 
um, and before we issue a new order, we'd like to, um, you know, close out that other one, correct? That would be the proper kind of timing of it? So from my research, if, if the impacts um, to resource areas are going to change, it needs to be a new order, not an amendment of the existing. So that, was, that I agree with. Yeah. Yeah. So that was why I recommended a new NOI. He has a new DEP number. And yes, we would want to close out that old one for no activity yep. happening under it. Okay. And, and we can we can simply do that as part of this hearing where you, you make the request to us. Um, and we would just have to follow up in writing or yeah. Yeah. So it's it's more of a just a timing thing. I think that's that's a procedural thing that we want to just make sure we take care of. Um, but let's get back to the plan and so forth. Uh, and if Jan, you could pull that back up and just zoom in on the entryway. Um, and then we can go around the commission to see if there's any questions. Um, yeah, just the, yeah. There we go. So, um, so if again, you could uh, slide it down a little bit because oh, the other way, I'm sorry, the other down. Um, I'm looking at, no, uh, really the, the house and so forth, that hasn't changed. It's really out by the roadway. Uh, but, yeah. And it's, so I'm looking for this still um, a culvert underneath the driveway. I'll ask that to Scott. Yes, that's correct. So the culvert comes underneath the driveway and then some riprap at the end. I asked the engineer to kind of shift it so that the riprap would be in the upland and then it could kind of dissipate through the riprap. Okay, spill I, I see it now. So yeah. so basically, so so where that um, where that culvert is now is that the um, the driveway coming in is raised up to meet the elevation of the public way and then to the you know plan north of the driveway, that's actually higher than the abutting um, existing site, and so right where the contours make a bend, you have a, a pipe that brings the water down, kind of in a southeasterly direction from plan view here, that discharges um, uh, where you can see the um, we can see the riprap, the little triangle there, and then that will go down and into the wetlands. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Because there's a, it's my understanding there's a pipe underneath the abutters um, driveway. So if we didn't put that pipe in, it would act, the driveway would act as a dam. So, right. We this would make this, sure yep. that water can flow through. All right. Thank you. That was what I was looking for. I was looking for it further up near the right of way, but um, I can see it's here. So, that was kind of my question. How tall is that retaining wall at the bottom? It's a maximum four feet. That's the, the highest that can go within the uh, setback. Okay. Requiring a zoning variance. All right. I uh, appreciate that. Um, and the reason why you're back here is because you requested the variance and it was not approved. Okay. That's correct. So that so ultimately, you know, I was trying to to minimize impacts by using that easement. It was denied, so that the the driveway is going to remain on this yeah. property. So it's based on the retaining wall, it's less filling of bordering um, land subject to flooding, but you have to clip the, that um, kind of that one little area that was at up near the uh, driveway where that was actually flagged as a bordering vegetated wetland, that's at flag 84. Okay. So I'll go around the commissions to see if anyone else has any questions and we'll check in with Leah on her on her uh, report. So Patrick, any other questions? I don't think I have anything else right now. Uh, Jonathan. Questions. Yeah. Uh, Leah, anything else from your report on this before um, we get to public comments? Yeah. So. On the previous order, um, Scott had requested two waivers. Um, so I think we need to bring those two into this order now. Um, so one was for work within the no disturb and the other was for um, the lack of 30,000 square feet of contiguous upland. Okay. And as far as um, 
you know, uh, issuing the waivers, we'll talk uh, about the findings on why we're issuing them just so that it's clear in the order. But we'll do that after we talk to the public. If I, if I may, one comment regarding the 30,000, it was determined by the commission that because where, this, where the driveway crosses is like a, a upgrading a channel that flows through there, the commission, if I remember correctly, determined that that didn't by itself, because it wasn't a wetland separating these areas, it was an upgrading a channel that I didn't require that waiver. That's my recollection of that decision. So, Leah, as far as that goes. I'm, I'm looking just to make sure. Yeah. So yeah, let's keep let's I'll, let's just keep going here. So, uh, Jonathan, any uh, comments or questions? Nope. Yeah. Uh, from my perspective, um, if you hadn't gone through asking for uh, the variance from zoning, that would be kind of what my question would be about. But you've done that already, so um, and you already have an answer on that. Okay. So I just looked at the order from last time and we did issue both waivers. I kind of remember the conversation Scott's talking about, but I think we determined that that drainage swale didn't have its own no disturb, I think is what we decided, but it, we issued the one for 30,000 square feet. Yeah, okay. And I'd rather uh, err on the side of, you know, having discussed it and issue it so there's not, you know, that's not an issue. So, um, so anything else that you have in your recommendations, Leah, before we open up to um, public comment? I just had one special condition, um, again, that we talked about last time, but it references um, the part of the regulations noting that further activity beyond what we're approving tonight would be prohibited on the lot. Okay. Uh, sounds applicable. Uh, so why don't we open it up to anyone who's here from the public that has any questions or comments. Um, and especially if you have questions or anything, uh, we've actually looked at this plan previously um, as far as where the house is and where the driveway crosses and where there's a culvert. We've looked at that previously. That hasn't changed, which we had previously issued an order of condition. What has changed is the driveway at the uh, public right away. So that's why the discussion tonight was on that. So if you either have questions on uh, what has changed or uh, even if you have questions on the house location or other things as it relates to the wetlands, uh, feel free to um, you know raise your hand um, and we'll be happy to promote you um, and actually uh, give you the ability to ask any questions. All right, we do have one attendee, um, Harry Lane. I will promote him. Very good. All right, if you could please just state your name and address and then go ahead and um, uh, ask any of the questions that you have. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Henry Lane, obviously. Uh, my address is 100 Main Street in Whitensville. And um, I guess I was unfortunately not a participant in the original hearing on the, on the house. Uh, I got involved later, so I don't have the background that I probably should have. But my I, I'm here uh, tonight on behalf of Catherine Mason, who was the northerly neighbor there. And I guess the concern is the actual flagging that was done above the culvert. Um, and again, that's not something that's changing today, but in retrospect, it looks like that flagging was, was not reviewed by an independent um, um, consultant, as, as, from what I understand. And I, my understanding was that traditionally, <clears throat> the commission does require an independent consultant to verify the wetland flagging. And since this actual, uh, since this actually alteration uh, proposed in this project, we think it's kind of critically important that the board not uh, waive its general practice and uh, require a, an independent consultant to review that wetland flagging to make sure that we're not missing anything. Okay, uh, <clears throat> a couple things on that. First, we're gonna check to see, Leah, was that reviewed? No, 
Okay. Um, unfortunately, uh, we approved that line and the 10 day appeal period for that approval has passed to appeal that uh, line. So when we issue an order of conditions where the delineation is there and based on our staff and reviewing it, um, yes, sometimes we do send out to uh, peer review, uh, but we don't always. That's not 100% of the time. Uh, but the reality is, is that has been issued by us and the appeal period is done. We can't um, open that. Is that Leah, I'm, I'm assuming because we have a line that was approved, even though this is a separate notice of intent, we can't open up that delineation discussion. That would be my understanding as well. Yeah, that, that's my interpretation of it because that, um, you know, uh, we have to go with what's in front of us. And because we've already reviewed that um, wetlands line and, and based on the conditions on the site accepted it, um, we don't have any recourse to open that up again. We can't, we don't have the authority to do that. So. When you say you uh, have already uh, approved that delineation, are you talking about the original notice of intent or a separate process? No, that's the original notice of intent. It is very common as it, I'm sorry, are you an attorney? I'm sorry, yes, I am. Okay, that's fine. So as an attorney, you know that when we issue it, unless we specifically don't indicate that uh, the delineation is um, is shown for approximation or hasn't been reviewed um, as part of the order of conditions, we are approving that line um, during the process of that submission. And that was the way it was submitted to us. I guess I understand that. I, But since this is an entirely new filing, I, I'm that, not sure that that delineation is uh, cast in concrete. Delineation is good for three years. And, and they can get a, uh, an extension of that delineation. That, I mean, that's just the regulations. Um, and that's, that's, you know, based on the actions of this commission to the date, that's, that delineation is set. Um, you can take that up with DEP, um, but I think the opportunity to um, appeal that has been missed. And that's my experience of, you know, working with the, um, not only the state regulations, but our bylaw. I'm not sure I agree, but I guess I have to live with it. You can reach out to DEP if you like. Um, you know, I'm not an attorney, but I've been doing this for a long time. No, thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Um, and anyone else with any other questions? And again, we're happy to, you know, respond to what's in front of us as far as this notice of intent. Uh, anything else, Jan? No, no one else has raised their hands. Okay. Um, we're going to kind of uh, discuss kind of the next steps, but if someone uh, does want to ask a question, please raise your hand. Uh, we're happy to answer anything or have the applicant answer anything. So, um, Leah, as far as, you know, as far as your recommendations and, you know, based on where we are with the um, information submitted, we're looking for the two waivers. Um, and then um, uh, we should also, um, because there's an outside, outstanding order of conditions, we should actually close that out based on um, no action. So, uh, so I'll go back to the applicant because it's the applicant who has to request that. Is that something that you want to uh, request as far as the outstanding order of conditions? I'll prepare an application and formally submit that. Okay, so one of the things with that, and that's absolutely fine. One of the things is that we would want to do um, it in order. We we it is our common practice that we don't issue a new order of conditions until until any active order of conditions on a site is cleared off. So um, and that's fine, um, but we would then want to Leah want to continue this hearing to our next meeting. I mean, we've always practiced that we didn't have two orders of conditions on a site. Well, I would respectfully request that the commission close the public hearing, issue the order of conditions, and in the meantime, we'll prepare the application so we're in 
it's it's on it's documented but yeah this is a public hearing we are having minutes um and if we were in person we would ask you to actually write that request in a meeting uh due to everything that's been going on in the world we are remote and we can't uh do that uh but it, it is part of the record and so the first order of uh business that we need to take care of is closing out that order of condition. Anything specific we should do, Leah, other than we have a request from the applicant? No, as long as he follows up with the paperwork. Yep. So do I have a motion uh, to close the existing um, order of conditions on this site uh, due to no action in the request well, from the applicant? Well, I was gonna, I think I was gonna request that prepare the, the formal application, make that request. Right. But we don't want to issue a new order of condition on something that already has an order of condition. Right, but I think I, I think technically I need to prepare the appropriate paperwork. Okay, and, and, that, and that's fine. I mean, okay. um, it, it's just that what we'll do is, is we won't, I'm just trying to think from a procedural standpoint, what's the correct thing to do? Um, I mean, we're going to discuss it um, as far as conditions and so forth, uh, look at what we had previously requested for conditions, uh, carry most of those over, and if there's any new conditions, uh, which other than getting the variances. Uh, and, and there's a one other is that a new condition, Leah? Is that no further um, activity? No, uh, that's not new. That's not new. That was, that's coming forward from the other one. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. So let me do a quick um, roll call of the commissioners. If the, anyone else has any other special conditions outside of our standard conditions, Patrick. Nothing to add. Okay, Jonathan. No, not beyond what's been mentioned. Okay. Um, so I don't have any more questions. The commission doesn't have any more questions. Um, it's really now just down to procedure, whether we can issue that order before we get the request to close. Any suggestions, Leah, on that process? Without having to go to the next meeting. We can do that. We can continue it to the next meeting and you can get the paperwork in. And then at the next meeting, um, you know, we would have everything prepared, but we would wait to that. I think that's a reasonable request. Okay. When's your next meeting? August 16th. August 16th. Okay. And, and that's fine. I mean, that just makes it easier because I, I want to make sure we go through the process in that um, just because uh, typically we just don't issue a new order if there's an outstanding one, so. Is there any outstanding things? Then you can also take care of the waiver requests also at the same time. Um, beyond that, I don't think we have anything else to add. Um, anything else, Leah? Nope. Okay. So what we'll do is if, if that's okay, what I'm hearing, Scott, is that you're requesting a continuance to the next meeting? Yes. Okay. So can I have a motion to continue this public hearing to our next uh, meeting? Uh, motion to continue the public hearing for 45 Creeper Hill Road to our um, to the next conservation meeting. Second. Okay, and Leah, that's uh, August? 16th. August 16th, thank you. Um, roll call vote, uh, Patrick? Yes. Uh, Jonathan? Yes. I am also a yes. And for the public in attendance, uh, just to, so that you know, is we will have this on the agenda um, at our next meeting and you're certainly free to attend and ask any questions at that point. So, all right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Uh, should we do the eight o'clock continuation? Sure. Okay. All right. Pursuant to the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act and the Grafton Wetlands Protection Bylaw, 
Conservation Commission will hold public hearing to act upon abbreviated notice of resource area delineation at 35 Crosby Road in Grafton. Uh, the applicant has requested a continuance uh, to our August 16th meeting. Do I have a motion? Motion to continue to August 16th. Do I have a second? second. We have a motion and a second. We'll call vote. Patrick? Yes. Uh, Jonathan? Yes. I am also a yes. Uh, that motion carries. Uh, four minutes, Leah. Okay. If you guys want to skip to the pretty large action item that lists like six or seven orders of conditions, um, these are six lots in Elm Rock Estates that are complete. We have as built plans, we have engineer letters, I've been by the sites. Um, they all the conditions are met for all of them with one exception, which is 21 Wheeler Road. Um, that one did not install the required no disturb barrier, so fence or boulders. I reached out to the applicant and let them know this afternoon. They let me know that they are quoting out um, a split rail fence um, and are okay rescheduling that one, 21 Wheeler Road to August 16, but I would recommend issuing COCs for the other five. So yeah. you talk 5, 11, 15, 13, and 17. Correct. Okay. I think um, an attendee from that address is raising their hand. All right, I'm gonna allow them to talk. Sure. Hi. Yeah, um, our signs are in place. They're just very- So could, could you um, just give your name and address for the Hi, record, I'm please? I'm 21 Wheeler Road. And I talked to Phil today and he says, well, the problem is they can't find your signs. The signs are there. They're just, just behind the wetlands barrier, which has been completely trampled by the animals. So some of them may have gotten knocked down. I can, if you come over, I can show you where they are too. You can, you can, you can see the rest are buried in the woods or they've been knocked down by the deer and the turkey that come up through the creek right onto my property every evening. The so I- are in place. So <laughs> I don't think that's what the issue is, Leah. It, it's the fence, right? You know, and they, there's never been a fence. There's never been a fence since I moved in here two years ago. That may be true, but in the order of condition, it required, it doesn't, we don't specify- um, what we want to do is have a visual barrier and we don't uh, specify it can be boulders, it can be a split rail fence, it can be mm -hmm. vegetation or whatever. So that is what's missing, not the signs. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, and um, then now, now um, because I do have two active game trails and the deer, the turkey, everybody comes up through my yard, through the creek and they come up through my yard and then they cross Wheeler Road and they go up to the farm every evening. Um, how i mean that's a, a fence of, of even a split rail i think is going to oh the split split rail will not impact any okay. uh, migration of the turkeys and deer, probably not for turkeys, the deer everybody yeah. if there's a creature in central massachusetts that comes to me are every single night so uh, and again <laughs> the whole idea of the split rail fence that's a choice by the um what is it? They haven't told me this yet. The reason I actually came on the meeting was to ask for an update because I can't get a straight answer out of these lines. Okay. Well, that's, and we're happy to, to tell okay. you what we've been told. Okay. And, and so, so what the condition says is that we want to put a visual barrier so that huh? people don't mow or do other things. That's all fine. Mm -hmm. The signs are there. That's mm -hmm. not the issue. Okay. It's just, they haven't done anything and they got back to Leah. Who is it, Leah, that you spoke to? Um... I forget his name. Phil He's, or Dave? Stephen no. O'Connell. Yeah, okay. uh, I, I haven't come across him yet. It was, okay. it was Stephen O'Connell, and he told me he talked to someone at Eastland this afternoon to start pricing out a split rail fence. But okay. like Sandy said, the choice of what the barrier is is up to the applicant. The split rail is behind, um, my friend lives at 11 Elmwalk, and they have the split rail that goes behind her, yeah. behind her, her unit. She doesn't have much yard. Um, right. And so that, I mean, yeah, that's fine. It's just there, there isn't any of that up on my whole side of the pond or anything up here at all. Which, is, which have, is why which is why we just talked about that's what's missing. Okay. It, um, and then once, that, once that's in place, then the wetlands barrier gets to come out. 
Because the reason that I, the, the wetlands barrier gets to come out, because the reason I've been pestering Elmrock, I mean, I'm Eastland, to move ahead is because the wetlands barrier is actually creating drainage issues because it's catching the water that's supposed to go, go into the creek and it doesn't and it's and it's washing out the road and three times I've had to have um, DPW come put the rocks back. Okay, uh, not quite sure where exactly that is that you're talking about. Right where my, right where basically the, the where the road and my, and the woodlands touch right at the very corner of my property right there, right there on, um, on Wheeler, basically closest up to Meadow Lane. So there's same. a creek right there. Same and me. the wetlands barrier make, basically makes a T and the water gets pooled right there and it's washing the road away. So go ahead, Leah. So she likely means the erosion control, which for the perimeter of the subdivision is still in place. And I've yeah. been talking to the developer about that because they also have the order for the infrastructure for the subdivision, which they are not looking to close out until possibly our August meeting. So we have been in communication with okay. them about the erosion control barrier. It's going to be in place until they're closing the entirety of the subdivision. And so that, that's supposed to be August? Is that they, what it is? They submitted a request to our office, potentially okay. for our August 16 meeting. It depends if we're able to have it peer reviewed in time. August 16th. Okay. Is yeah. it possible if somebody can let me know that if that's going to happen on August 16th so I can come to the meeting again? Just because, so, I mean, my, my front, part of my front yard and part of the road is washing away every time we get a heavy rain. So, so as far as the agendas and so forth, they're posted online so you can okay. do that. But All you right, can okay. also just reach out to staff during the week and okay. ask the questions. You know, everything that we do is, is public information. Okay. So, it, you know, all of the agendas are public, um, you know, attending it obviously is, is, is up to you and so forth. And then uh, whenever we have this, just let Leah know or, uh, or Jan know that you're attending. We'll mm -hmm. make sure that we, you know, call on you if you have questions and also just feel free if you want an update uh, to check in with the office. Um, okay. And again, we're just chasing down the different yeah, components. Yeah, I'm, I'm just done. trying to nudge them to chase down because they haven't done anything. Yep. Next month, I'll have lived in this house for two years. Yeah, and and it <laughs> is the it is the applicant's responsibility yes. to remove yes. to remove that uh, erosion yes. control. So, yes. and, and I know DPW wants it to move forward as fast as possible unofficially yep. because they're they're very tired of me basically griping to them. The rocks are gone again. Please come put them back. Right. So, I mean, I, I, I think we're on the same page, okay. but yeah, but yeah, feel free to reach out and we'll happy to let you know what we know. And you're absolutely, obviously welcome to okay. attend. Any so it's a hearings. split road fence and is it going to go all the way from the road, basically following the wood line? Like, uh, so right we'd, have to we'd have to take a look at the plan, but it's along the whole wetlands. So yes. Oh, wow. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. And again, feel free to reach out. No, this is actually very helpful. I got some great information out of them. The split rail fence. I mean, if there's any questions, the homeowner definitely likes the look of the split rail fence. That's not good. Yeah, yeah. We that's why we leave it up to the applicant, depending yeah. upon the individual parcel and what people want to do. Uh, we don't we don't care. Mm -hmm. That's not what our responsibility mm -hmm. is. Our responsibility is just to have what we do is just so that people understand there's something there that you shouldn't do things in. Yeah, no, we, I'm, we're very cognizant. I mean, we, one of the reasons we actually bought this house as opposed to one on Elm Rock is because it's a quarter acre of wetlands. Right. Um, so, that, and we, we enjoy owning the wetlands because I mean, we'll, we'll never have a neighbor next door on that one site. We'll always have nature. It's great. Yep. It is. Yes, so, it is. That there's some, and it's a some responsibility. We, and we're enjoying the turkey and the, and the deer and everybody. So we All don't right. mind in the least. I just didn't know that they were requ requiring that too, but um, that's great. <laughs> no, All that's, right. that's great. Thank you so much. I will. Right. You're welcome. Let you guys get back to me. And thank you. Yep. Bye bye. Uh, anyone else on this? So let's see. It's eight twenty. The next hearing is at eight fifteen. Let's move on to the next hearing. We need to. Um... You need to make a motion on the five other certificates okay. of compliance. All right. So if someone wants to make a motion on the the other ones for uh, issuing the certificate of compliance. Do they each need to be read out? You can uh, just 
we can do all at once. Right. Like read out each one, each address. Is that enough? That's good. Okay. Um, motion to issue the certificates of reliance for uh, five Elmer. Elm Rock Drive, 11 Elm Rock Drive, 15 Elm Rock Drive, 13 Elm Rock Drive, and 17 Elm Rock Drive. All right, thank you. Second. second. Good. We got a motion and a second. Roll call vote. Patrick? Yes. Uh, Jonathan? Yes. I am also a yes, so thank you. Okay. Now we're moving on to 100 Westboro Road. Okay. Ms. Uh, Chairperson, may, may, I, may I ask a question before you begin? Sure. Um, hello, <laughs> good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Mastriani uh, with Pulte Homes. And I noticed there's only three commissioners tonight. And um, I was just going to ask a clarification uh, question. Um, so is, are the other commissioners who are not here tonight and able to participate, are they, uh, if assuming we do not close to the, the public hearing tonight, are they able to participate at the next hearing and be, be a contributing voting member of the uh, commission on our application? Yep, no, it's a great question. Uh, we do have a procedure since all of our meetings are taped. If they actually watch the previous meetings that had to do with this particular meeting, um, Leah, remind me what that is called. The Mullen rule. The Mullen rule, thank you. I kept thinking of the Dover Amendment, but the Mullen rule states that if as a commissioner, I actually watch the proceedings of the previous meeting and I have to actually sign off on, on saying that I did, then I can yep, participate sure. on the next one. Okay, so, that, that's fantastic. So we, we try to follow that process um, just because, you know, having it, we'd love to have five members here all the time. Doesn't happen, but we do have a process that we can um, you know, make sure that okay. someone does. And usually when that happens, we make the applicant aware of it. And if they have any issues, you know, they can uh, express them, but that's state law. So. Okay, great. Um, and <clears throat> that, that's great. I, I think that that sounds fine. Um, and then I'll just ask another question. Do you know if the commission or does the commission have any other business to discuss tonight? Um, you know, if, if you don't, then we're prepared to um, Essex prepared to to do our presentation, but we're we're uh, we were waiting for Matt Leidner, our engineer, um, to get off of his other meeting and join this one. And the timing isn't working out as great as we anticipated, but he's close. So we um, so we do have other action items and discussion items to go through. We um, let me double check. We don't have any other public hearings. You are the last public hearing, correct? Correct. We are. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, and again, we can go through this, and if he joins, that's great. Um, uh, we can play it by ear, and you can let us know what you want to do. But, um, but let's get into it, and um, and we can go from there. So, uh, so pursuant to the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act, the Grafton Stormwater Management Bylaw, the Grafton Wetlands Protection Bylaw. Uh, conservation can hold a public hearing to act upon a request to amend the order of condition wetlands protection bylaw permit and stormwater management bylaw permit for the construction of a mixed use development at 100 Westboro Road. Um, and so go ahead, Mark, please name, uh, please state your name and address and take it away. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Mark Mastriani. I'm with Pulte Homes and I'm here with Essex Petrie and um, I think Essek is uh, going to do most of the speaking. All right, sounds good. All right, thanks, Mark. Uh, thank you, Sandy and uh, Commissioner members. Uh, so as Mark mentioned, uh, Matt Leidner will be joining us uh, eventually, um, of Civil Design Group. Um, but uh, as you mentioned, uh, we are here to discuss the Afonso Village mixed use community. Uh, in particular, we're requesting uh, an amendment, uh, an approval of the amendment to your conditions that was issued on July 29th, 2020. Uh, the project site's located at 100 Westboro Road. It's adjacent to the intersection with Institute Road. Uh, the approved project included two three story mixed use buildings, uh, three three story residential buildings. I have four townhomes for a total of roughly 14,000 square feet of retail and 105 dwelling units. 
along with the associated parking. Uh, and if you recall, uh, we presented some preliminary con uh, conceptual site plan modifications uh, to the commission as a discussion item earlier this year. Uh, and since that time, we've kind of developed a renewed approach with our partners at Afonso uh, that it keeps the original intent of the application, uh, it aligns with the goals of the commission, and it reduces uh, impervious surfaces from the approved plan. The primary difference uh, is that what we what we talked about in our informal session, uh, as far as um, the approach, we we're actually going to preserve the residential units on the second and third floor of the buildings that are fronting Westboro Road. And so what this will actually mean is an increase of 32 units from what was originally approved, but the foot building footprints don't change. Um, and so we'll talk about that in more detail when we present the plans. Uh, and I can, I can demonstrate that and show you where those additional units are located. Uh, I just also want to note that we did present this updated program at a development team meeting in May uh, with Chris McGoldrick was there, uh, Leah was there as well, as well as uh, Building Inspector Bob Berger. Uh, we received a number of comments during that session that helped us kind of refine the plan that we're presenting tonight. We did also present this design package to the planning board on July 11th. Uh, we were met with favorable response from the board. We are scheduled to go back in uh, a week and a half, I believe it's August 8th, um, once we get our peer review from uh, Jeff Walsh's team at Graves Engineering, uh, as well as we have got a, um, a memo uh, amendment to the traffic study that was done, um, just ad addressing the additional 32 units. Uh, we have also uh, reached out to the Grafton uh, Water District and the Sewer Department and confirmed with both of those utilities that uh, they have no concerns uh, servicing the project um, with those additional units. Um, and so with that, uh, Jan, if you wouldn't mind um, pulling up uh, the plan, the approved site plan from uh, 2020. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. So this was the approved plan. Um, as you can see, there were uh, two buildings fronting Westboro Road. Those are buildings A and B. Uh, as approved, those are commercial retail on the first floor with two, store, two floors of residential rental units above them, 16 units on each building, so a total of 32 units. Uh, and there was also uh, Four townhomes uh, you can see adjacent to Institute Road right at the uh, driveway entrance there, as well as um, three um, three story residential buildings. Uh, so if you can, we have uh, the next plan, the uh, we have our render plan showing our, we can talk to this one, um, yeah, either one. That works. All right, so this is um, what we're calling our comparison plan, just to kind of help give context to um, what we're looking at in our plan. And so if you um, go to the, that rendering, I'll, I'll uh, speak in more detail to that one as far as what the plan is. So uh, as you can see, the buildings that front Westboro Road, There we go, uh, are unchanged. Um, so as, as approved, it's two uh, three-story buildings with first floor commercial and then two stories of residential above it. Again, 32 rental units. Um, and then the, the uh, multifamily portion of it, kind of in the southern portion of the parcel has shifted. We um, have moved. Um, previously in the, in the approved plan where those townhomes are currently, there's five uh, townhomes kind of on the western portion there that was previously a parking lot for um, both surfaces or both um, uses, the mixed use in the, the front and then the multifamily uh, kind of in the back. Uh, our two buildings are uh, proposed there. 50 unit four story building with garage under. So with that, we're able to significantly reduce the amount of parking uh, that is associated, um, particularly with uh, the multifamily buildings. We still uh, have 
uh, plenty of parking as far as what our needs are. Uh, we're well within the requirements of the town and we met with Inspector Berger as far as what the town is comfortable with, um, but it is is reduced what was uh, originally in the approved plan. And that has allowed us, um, again, it's roughly about a 0.4 acre reduction in uh, pervious um, from uh, what was originally approved. Since we, uh, brought this plan to you, you guys in the, the informal discussion. We have submitted a full set of plans, uh, including grading plans, uh, drainage, and, and stormwater. Uh, I spoke with Jeff Walsh earlier today, and as part of the planning board submittal, he is uh, doing the overall uh, the peer review. Um, so he hoped that he'll be done uh, within a week, uh, or the end of this week, or early next week. Uh, but the stormwater basin, uh, it is unchanged. Um, the moving of the larger buildings to the eastern portion, and uh, it, it really eliminates all pavement from the 100 foot buffer zone uh, around the, the, the wetlands on the western portion of the site. Uh, it's, it's really welcome as far as it's a less intensive use, swapping out the townhomes um, for the parking areas. And um, we have no, no changes to the limit of work that was um, within that 100 foot, 100 foot buffer zone. So we're really excited to move this forward with the Conservation Commission. As I said, we uh, had, a, had a great discussion with planning board uh, a week and a half ago. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to um, you know, answering any questions you may have of us and um, working through this with the commission. sure if you're talking sandy but you're on mute oh sorry. yeah i was wondering oh again. sorry about uh, that no i about actually awkward silences earlier sandy that was uh, that was a pretty uncomfortable one there for oh geez no sorry <laughs> about that i i yeah no problem uh so i was just asking leah i know that you've already looked at this if you could give just a quick report of uh what your report finds sure um so essex actually covered a few of my bullet points um so we are waiting on the peer review, as you mentioned. Um, this has 8% less impervious surface, um, no changes to the basin, as you mentioned, swapping the, the townhomes with the parking area um, adjacent to resource areas. Um, the one thing that he didn't cover is just a note that we did receive a copy of the easement between the two developments. That was something the commission mentioned back at that um, informal discussion, as well as um, sign off from the previous applicant on this uh, application for an amendment. So those, those were two items that you guys mentioned last time. So we do have those. Great, and, and Leah, just um, if, I, if, you, if you don't mind um, to uh, kind of expand upon that second point. Um, since that kind of informal discussion, we are really um, formalized our partnership with uh, the original applicant, uh, Afonso, uh, and his team. Uh, Amanda, I believe, is a cavalier from GNH, has been um, kind of the, their engineer. And so we are working hand in hand with them uh, moving forward on this. All right. Uh, thank you. Yeah, obviously, and I'll go around the commissions to see if anyone has any questions. Obviously, the switching out and putting the uh, townhomes uh, closer to the um, the wetlands and it basically greening the area in and around the wetlands and specifically within the buffer zone, except for the uh, stormwater uh, basin. Um, obviously, that is a uh, from our perspective of protecting the wetlands is a positive move, as you mentioned that. Um, that this is being peer reviewed. And so we would just wanna see the results of that. I mean, you're reducing impervious, but just because of the changes, wanna make sure there's no other unintended consequences of moving everything around as far as the stormwater goes, but you know, we'll um, also you know, get, the, um, get the peer review um, you know, uh, comments uh, that is already gonna be done for planning board. So um, 
you know, we'll, we'll wait for Jeff's, uh, you know, review and so forth. But I, you know, so if there's no changes to the system itself and, and you're just reducing the imperviousness, that should be fairly straightforward. Um, I don't have any other questions. I think it's a positive move. Uh, so let me go to uh, the roll call of commissioners. Uh, Patrick, any kind of questions? Um, no, nothing that wasn't already brought up. And Jonathan, any questions or comments? Nope, I didn't have any questions. Okay, great. So, um, so we're, what we're looking at now is just just to wait to get uh, the peer review, um, and then we'll just open it up to the public to see if they have any comments or questions. Uh, Leah, anything else? Uh, everything else seems to be have taken care of. You've now submitted a full uh, plan set. You came into us with concept. Now you've done a formal request for the change. I think the fact that you came here and, um, and this was part of a public hearing was needed, but um, I think it's, everything's appropriate to move forward. So at this point, uh, would like to open up to uh, any public, and if you do have any comments or questions on this project in this speci specific case, amendment to an order of condition already issued, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, we'd be happy to, um, you know, have you become a presenter and ask those questions. So Jan, let me know if there's anyone looking to ask questions. No one yet. Okay, uh, so I'll we'll kind of continue moving ahead. And if anyone does have any questions, we'll, we'll you know, recognize them and, and answer those questions. So um, from our perspective, you know, you've submitted everything. The only thing that we're waiting on is a peer review. So I would ask you if, if you would like to continue to the next hearing and hopefully we'll have that in hand and can uh, then vote on it. Yes, I uh, appreciate that, uh, offering that up. And we, we were, so respectfully request to be continued to the next meeting. Appreciate that. Any uh, any attendees looking to ask a question? Nope. Okay. Uh, do you have any any questions or anything at this point? Otherwise, we'll just continue it to the next meeting. No, just uh, confirm. I believe it was August sixteenth. Is that the uh, next meeting? Yeah, yes. that's right. That's okay. correct. Yep. Great. So, do I have a motion to continue this hearing? Motion to continue to August sixteenth. Second. We have a motion to second. Roll call vote. Patrick? Yes. Uh, Jonathan? Yes. And I'm also a yes, so the motion carries. See you on the 16th. Great. Thank you all very much. Appreciate your time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We are moving on to other action items. Four. Um, we left off at the COC request for 188 Worcester Street. Um, so we have an as-built plan for, for this one, as well as a letter from their engineer. The work is done, the site's stable. Um, I checked the conditions, they've met everything. So I recommend issuing the cer certificate of compliance. All right, thank you. Do I have a motion? A uh, motion to issue the certificate of compliance for 188 Worcester Street. Second. Roll call vote, Patrick? Yes. Uh, Jonathan? Yes. I am also yes. The motion carries. Next okay. up. Um, so I grouped together. We have two requests for partial COCs from the same orders. Um, so the, the orders were for the entirety of Highfield subdivision, but these are two individual house lots looking for clearance at um, three Manor Hill Drive and 70 McGill Drive. Those Lots are all set, everything's stable, grass is growing. So I recommend issuing partial COCs. All right, thank you. So we're looking for a partial COC. Do I have a motion? A motion to issue partial certificates of compliance for three Manor Hill Drive and 70 McGill Drive. Second. Uh, motion and a second. Oh, we have a tip over of my <laughs> camera again. Uh, let's do a roll call vote. That's a really weird view, okay. <laughs> Go on, get, get off my camera. Okay, um, uh, roll call vote, Patrick. Yes. Uh, Jonathan. Oh, didn't hear you that time, Jonathan. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I am also a yes, motion passes. Next up, Leah. 
We have a request for a minor change to 29 Pollard Road. Um, so this was a single family house lot um, in the riverfront area. They're proposing, if you guys remember, it's gonna be like housing for um, yep. some kind of medical facilities escaping me right now. But either way, um, we closed the hearing and we had a condition that they would provide a plan to shift the disturbance out of the inner riparian zone. Um, so they went to submit that plan to me, but in order to make that shift, it resulted in a net increase of 300 square feet um, riverfront impact. So I went back to the plan that you guys had seen that night and called that the approved plan and then had them come back um, requesting a minor change for that um, shift out of the inner riparian instead so that you guys could make that determination and it wasn't up to me. Um, okay. So we're back to explore that now. Okay, so this is the one where the um, there's a sewer line that really goes through the, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and they couldn't move it. They checked it, that kind of stuff. Correct. Do you want to just bring up the plan real quick and we can take a quick look at it and make a determination on it? Sure. We also do have a hand raise from a phone number. So that might be somebody um, related. Okay. Do we so want to... Yeah, once you bring up the plan, go ahead and, and promote that person and whoever that is, please give your name and um, address when you have that opportunity. All right, they are promoted to talk and I'll get the plan up. Yeah. Please say your name and address and go ahead and if you have something to ask about this particular change. Um, sure. Um... If you can hear me, I'm James Tatro from Azimuth Land Design here representing the applicants. And uh, can you hear me first? <laughs> yes, yes, we can. Okay. Uh, and um, as Leah has said, uh, this was an item that there was discussion at the end of the process before about moving the uh, work entirely out of the inner riparian zone in the area of the house and the uh, driveway. And, and this uh, uh, alternative plan dated uh, December 22nd does that and I um, it basically moves the house and the house about 10 feet south southeast uh, and there's a little bit of movement and rotation of the uh, um, the, the parking area immediately in front of it um, and it as she said it alters actually a total of 370 square feet more uh, riverfront area it just takes the uh, riverfront area alteration from uh, uh, I believe it's from I'm trying to find the percentages yeah from 8.3 to 8.6 percent um, it doesn't uh, have any work any closer to the riverfront it just and, and in fact pulls that uh, parking area outside of it okay outside of I should say the inner inner riparian zone correct yeah so um kind of uh, my initial take on this I'd rather see uh, the disturbance move further away from the river even if it you know happens to tweak up slightly uh, the other as long as they're still within the percentages um, that first hundred feet is probably more critical to protection of the river river itself and um, but let me check with the commissioners see if what they have as far as comments so Patrick yeah, I mean, what you just said makes sense. Makes sense. So I would tend to agree with that. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan? Yeah, I also agree. Yeah. And then my only other question is, do you look at other ways to kind of twist things to try to not increase the area and the overall area and still get it out of the um, inner riparian? Uh, well, we're... Uh... To the chair, we also ran into a, a bit of an issue that there's an obscure provision in your uh, zoning bylaw that says uh, you are not supposed to have a driveway within 10 feet of an abutter's property, yep. um, except at your entrance. And one of the things we did, in addition to um, pulling this parking area uh, out of the inner riparian zone, was rotate and move move things slightly to get it that 10 feet away from that uh, that abutting property line for the property at number 25 Pollard. Okay. 
that was even, a, a small factor in, in some of the extra square footage. Yeah. Um, and even at the corner, you don't have to be 10 feet away? Well, there's sort of nothing we can do there. I mean, <laughs> um, I, we're actually sort of going back and forth with the building inspector because uh, he was bringing this up and our response was, well, you know, look, we can't get out of the inner riparian zone, but we are, you know, it is prescribed that you try and stay as far away as, as, as you can. Uh, and that's what we're doing, which is why we're, you know, some of this driveway within 10 feet of that, uh, the abutting property at 25. Um, so, uh, again, we're sort of trying to uh, work a delicate balance between uh, satisfying uh, uh, one regulation and another. Uh, we're and hoping that with, with this still being un clearly under 10 percent, that this would be Gotcha. And then anything as far as the zoning, we don't have any comment or any kind of, yep. you know, direction for you. That that's not us. So, um, yeah. All right. Anything else, Leah, from your perspective? Okay. So, um, I would just. Um, so this is uh, a discussion item. So I don't have to open it up to the public. Correct. It's an action item, but but you're correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, if there is anyone out there, you can always raise your hand. We'll, you know, listen to if you have a question. Um, having seen that, I'll do, uh, you know, quick check in with commissioners. Uh, Patrick, anything else you want to see or hear? No, nothing else. Jonathan? Nope. Uh, do we have a motion to accept this minor change? Motion to accept the minor change for 29 Bullet Road. Second. We have a motion and a second. Roll call vote. Uh, Patrick. Yes. Uh, Jonathan. Yes. I am also a yes. Uh, that motion carries. Thank you very much for your consideration. All right. Good luck. My cat. <laughs> yeah, he's he's a star. Star of the show. All right, um, up next, Leah. Um, before we hit the discussion items, I do have one other action item that came in um, under our 48 hour window, which is um, at Prentice Place. They need to um, install an additional utility pole versus they were previously gonna run the line underground. Um, that pole is going to be within our approved limit of work. So they are just requesting that it be considered a minor change. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly, if it's within the limit of work, I, I don't I don't know if you want to bring up a plan. I don't see any issue with that. Um, Patrick, any issue with that? I can't see. I can't see any. I'll pull it up. Yep, thank you. Can't see the door being any, I mean. Right. It's just easier, yeah. So it's what, the what's the red. change, Leah? It's it's trying to go below ground as opposed to above or above other way, the... other way around. It was going to be an underground line. Um, now they have to that red dot that the arrow's pointing to is going to be a new pole, um, and then the line from there I think is underground, but from the road is overhead. It crosses the road overhead. It, they're not letting them cut the pavement. In the roadway, gotcha. Yeah, I I certainly don't have any issue with everything else going on with that limit of work. Um, and if no one else has any other questions on that, can I have uh, a motion to approve this minor uh, change? Motion to approve uh, minor change for was it twenty one Kirkville Road? Uh, Prentice Place. <laughs> Prentice Place. I was just reading. <laughs> um, yeah. Second. And Jonathan seconds. Okay. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, I'll do a roll call vote, Patrick. Yes. Uh, Jonathan. Yes. Uh, I am also a yes. Uh, that carries. And the minor change is, change is approved. Okay. So now we have our discussion items and 
I keep making Jan shuffle around the visuals for you guys, but if you can pull up um, a photo or two from for Bridal Ridge Drive. Mm -hmm. um, so we got a report from a resident that their neighbor was clearing brush and then piling it within um, potentially wetlands on his property. Um, so it's along the, the edge on the right hand side of the screen of this photo. Um, and then if you want to go to one of the ones with like the, yeah, the pile. Oh, geez, in the woods. Okay. Um, so I did send these photos to Art just for his quick take on it. Um, he did say that he can see some wetland species present, but to know for sure what is or isn't in a resource area, um, he'd need to go out in the field. So before I pulled the trigger on that, I just wanted to get you guys take on how you wanted to proceed, if you want me to loop him in and that's something you want to spend money on or what next steps you'd like me to take. Uh, great questions. I would prefer if you would go out and just, I mean, I don't think he needs to flag it. He just needs to identify if it is or isn't. And then we can reach out to uh, the person who's um, doing this clearing and, and dumping and so forth and have, and, and, you know, and ask them to remove it. And if they don't, we can issue an enforcement order. Okay. So proceed with art. Yeah. And what, what are we talking as far? I just want to make sure that we're not, that as far as a budget goes, we have a resources to, to have someone do that. I'm not going to I mean, have any so, of the... so most of the time when we hire art, it's coming from an applicant's money. Right. That they, so in this case, it would come out of our budget, probably professional and technical, which I think we only have 200 bucks for the year. <laughs> okay. Um, usually we spend that on like, if we had to reschedule a meeting and repost ads, um, due to like we didn't have a quorum or something that was like our our bad yep. you know we we flip that bill for people um so the 200 is usually adequate but we don't often have other things come up like this so what about some of our other like um funds where we that we get that's, from yeah that's true we could probably use um the fees yeah i mean I, i'm trying to think that would be appropriate because that is directly yeah. to do with wetlands and you know you can let you know art know and and again i'm not looking for him to go out and do a full delineation um you know that level of it well, i don't think we're there but it would be good to get someone out there and say yes this has all the appearances of a uh, of a wetlands and is protected without actually delineating it you know a site visit and so forth and then use the funds that you know we have uh that we get from fees to do that and then we'll okay. keep it at that level uh reach out to the um uh the owner and so forth and at, with a letter and see what the response is and then follow up with that okay does that okay. sound like a, a process so patrick that sound good to you yeah uh jonathan anything else i had, I had a couple questions so this is a neighbor that's complaining about a neighbor that may or may not be dumping in the wetlands. So does art, I'm assuming art's a surveyor or some type of land. Wetland, sci wetland scientist. Yeah. So do we need to, most of the properties we look at involve having a survey. So does that involve that we need to have a survey to see where the DMARC lines are? Or, because again, if it's their property, just not into the wetlands, would we need to do does art need to do a survey in order to make it enforceable? So somebody do a survey or is it just you're dumping stuff where there are ferns that are a wetland species and that's not allowed? It, I mean, was this something that came before the, the commission in the past or was this before, like, how do we know? Is there wetland close by? And it's there, the line is unclear, or was there signage that was taken down? Is there a split layer? You know, we talk constantly about barriers and everything. So, was this something that was before all that? And there's maybe or maybe not an enforceable order of, you know, dumping in the wetlands, or is there something that we can rely on from our history that says, here's the line, here's where the signs used to be, or there was something there? So, Sorry, there's a lot of questions. I can take that if you'd like, Sandy. Please do. 
So um, I believe for Bridal Ridge did have a filing with us, but it was quite a while ago. Um, and it was for um, a different part of the property. It's, it's kind of a big property. Um, so the plan that we have shows wetlands on the property, but it doesn't show this area specifically. Um, I believe you can see wetlands on our estimated GIS layer. Um, so we'd be looking to have Art go out to see what he can tell is or isn't wetland now because we don't have enough information or enough current information off of those files. Right. And also, Jonathan, your question about property lines and so forth, that's a good one. I mean, I, I think, you know, um, you know, with Art's kind of experience in, you know, doing this and what we're really looking for, because we're not looking to have a definitive, we just are looking for the basic, yes, it's a wetlands and yes, there's dumping. Yeah. Typically on a subdivision like that, you'll have monuments and so forth. And uh, between, you know, what's available through assessors and what our old plants have, we can see if there's monuments or stone walls or something else that you can um, look at the approximate location of the wetlands. And again, if it looks like, wow, it's right by the, the line, we're not sure if it yes or no. I think it's, it's kind of a, a first go out, take a look at it, assess it. And if it's really obvious that it is a wetlands and there's been dumping there and it's connected, it's, it's a regul regulated area. It's like a boarding vegetated wetlands that's connected mm -hmm. to something else. Usually um, someone like Art can go out and make that determination without preparing any plans or anything. And then it's more of, you know, hey, we've we've done this due diligence. We know it's a, you know, it has all of the um, uh, components of, of a wetland and so forth. And then uh, use it on the, like a, just a letter, you know, a written letter to see if the uh, homeowner will take care of it. Um, and if they don't, and, and we'll have to listen to what Art says as far as what that wetlands is, if it's really obvious or it's a transitional zone or anything else. It's really, you know, yes, there's some information on an old plan. There's information on the GIS, GIS layer, but that has to be confirmed in the field. But all of your questions are good because Art could go out there. And it's very easy and he could say it and we could have that information that we need. Or he could come back and say, wow, it's a big transitional zone. And this is what I would need to do to figure out where the wetlands are. And that's a different type of response that we would have to look at. So does that answer okay. your questions? It does. And the only other additional question that I've got is how often do we get these complaints and how often do we go spend money chasing them like this? Um, you know, is this something that comes up once a year? And it's, it's again, to Leah's point, we don't have a fund for this. We don't have a bucket of money to go and chase the complaints because normally it's funded by the applicant or um, et cetera. So I, I just, I wouldn't want to create a, I, I want to attend to a potential violation or a problem, but I don't necessarily want to open the door for all of the neighbors, you know, and again, I just don't know if it's a commonality or if it's something that is a rarity. Um, I don't know how many people watch these things, but if they've got a beef with the neighbor and then they go out, he looks like he's dumping something on, on, on conservation land and then we get 20 of these. So um, I just didn't know if there was a precedent. I didn't know how often it happens because I think in my couple of years of doing this, I think this is the one of the, the first ones that was something that we had to fund the research of. So to answer your question about complaints, <laughs> neighbor to neighbor complaints, we get a lot of them. Um, a lot of them we're able to resolve from documents or GIS layers or me going by and checking things out. But now and then we have one that it's debatable and I, I need a little assistance um, to figure out where we go from here. So we get a lot of complaints, but not often ones that I don't think a lot would elevate to the level of having to, to foot the bill, as you say. And then, and also we do have different funds that we have um, that, you know, all the fees that come in, um, they're actually pretty highly regulated what we can and cannot use them for. So, so one of these, this areas, we let it build and, and, and you'll, every once in a while, you'll, Leah will come back and say, can we use this for this? But it's pretty, 
prescribed and what it can be used for. Uh, you know, one of the things we use it for is, uh, you know, Leah's part of Leah's salary. And so that's, so it's not this endless, you know, bucket or anything, um, but it's also only can be used for uh, specific things related to wetlands. And this is one thing that it would fall under. So we're not taking that out of, um, you know, out of uh, the budget that, you know, we as described as that 200 bucks, it's actually a different fund. Uh, but mm -hmm. to your point, it's not something we want to make a habit of. And which is why I'm saying I don't want art to go out there and delineate something. It, it's really, Leah's looked at it, it's questionable. And so it's just getting him to give his opinion. And hopefully he comes back with a pretty definitive. If he doesn't, then we have to have, to have another discussion. Um, you know. So can he enter that property with, so he can go and enter that property and, and review this area and in an hour, probably say, I mean, if we're talking about, you know, Five hundred dollars or something. Again, I just I don't know what the the amount the consultants charge for things is wild. So that's the only reason I ask is because. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's excellent! Friends. It's excellent questions because, it, it, and this is a good good conversation so that we can you know communicate. I like I have a certain expectation that you're hiring for a couple of hours of uh, of his time. Art will go out there, do kind of a you know a look at it, use his experience. To determine, hey, yeah, this is easily a wetlands. It's not. We can direct them to say, you know, if this is a big transitional area, we're not looking to get super detailed, but we're looking to support kind of, um, you know, Aaliyah's kind of her effort that she's already looked at it, but it's a questionable and have a professional look at it, but not. But I think hopefully I'm clear, Leah, that I'm not looking for him to delineate the wetlands. I'm looking for him to identify if it's there and if there's a reason we should, you know, go to the owner and so forth. So that that's kind of, I'm, I'm trying to do it baby steps. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. No, that that's helpful. I appreciate the explanation and, and no, I, I think that makes sense that we should have, that's my opinion is that I think we should have art or someone yep. go take a look. I think that's- Yeah, good. and again, we, you know, hopefully it 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 is, it is that effort, all, that's all it takes to kind of get it resolved. I have no idea if that's going to be it. But yeah. um, it gives us it gives us um, the ability to then reach out to that homeowner with confidence, um, and then we'll see what happens at the next step. So, okay, sorry to drag it out. I just wanted to ask because I wasn't sure of the process there. No, it's good questions because, yeah, and and I think this conversation helped me to express the fact I am not looking for a full delineation. I'm looking for a little support for Leah to look at this area to see if it's if he can easily um, uh, identify the characteristics of a wetlands that's obvious. So, anything else on that, Leah? Not on that one, no. Okay. Ready to move on? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so I wanted to talk to you guys about. Um, the culvert on Hennessy that washed out that we've been talking about a little bit here and there. Um, you guys remember that or do you need a yes. little recap? Okay. <laughs> um, so I've been talking with Art and Jeff getting their assistance and figuring out what our best solution is going forward. Um, we're looking at bridge versus culvert as well as pedestrian loading versus vehicular loading for that space. Um, Jeff's working to get ballpark figures on those four options and what that would look like so that we know how to proceed for funding purposes. Um, so we've come up with, it is a challenging spot. It's, um, it's riverfront. It's a flood way as well as flood Ooh, plain. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And it's in the ACEC. Um, we do have our eye on mass wildlife's Habitat Management Grant. Um, Jan's been talking to the representative of that program and they think it's a good candidate for it because it fixing this culvert is what's gonna let us keep mowing the grasslands um, for the grassland birds yep. uh, beyond the stream. 
So hopefully we would go after that grant. Hopefully we would get that grant as a backup. I'm going to have it as a placeholder for the town's capital plan as well, um, so that we have a backup funding source. Um, Jeff's. Oh, uh, just ahead. a quick question on, on yeah. money. Is there a potential for CPC on this? I'm trying to think. I haven't seen something like this, but uh, open I space. Ask. I, I think if you if you could reach out and, and and talk to Joanne and just see if this would even qualify. I don't know if it would or not because they don't do maintenance. So this is a little mm -hmm. bit. I don't know. I just don't know the answer to that. So. Yeah, I can ask her. Um, so. I mean, I don't have figures for you guys tonight. I was hoping to, um, but I still wanted to have the conversation and just get your thoughts, preferences, questions um, about, you know, bridge versus culvert, pedestrian versus vehicular. We'll obviously need to be meeting the regulations um, and going through all the permitting process there. Um, Jeff's opinion, he was thinking, you know, if order of magnitude of cost isn't prohibitive, he his recommendation was to go ahead and go for the vehicular loading just for any like future activity on the site we can't even foresee or emergency access back there. Um, and also the fact that even if we went like smaller scale bridge or something, we would still have to do something to stabilize the channel. So it's kind of like a trade-off in cost. Um, so I know we don't have a ton of information to work with now, and we'll keep having these conversations, but I just wanted any preliminary thoughts you guys might have before we start walking so, further down this path. And I just have a couple questions. I certainly don't have any answers at this point. It's a fairly small stream, right? Yeah, so it was an old... Um, I don't know, 12, 16 inch, something like that, culvert pipe. Okay. But it's sunk significantly into the ground and has washed out a couple feet in either direction. Gotcha. So it, it's a it's a, almost like a drainage way that yeah. has some, you know, spring flow and things like that. Yep. Dries out um, at different time, probably dries a bone right now. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there is that. Uh, so... And again, one of the things that I'm thinking of, uh, and um, and I've not that I've ever seen this, but the difference between a vehicular loading and not, and so forth, is if you're going to have to stabilize, you know, uh, the actual stream bed and so forth. If there and it dries out, I'm just wondering if there's a way to install um, a crossing for the lawnmowers and vehicles without having a bridge and then just have a pedestrian bridge, you know, a stabilized bank and so forth. I'm just trying to think of something that's creative that. So like you're talking like um, kind of like what, I don't know what the scout built for us at Great Meadow type of thing, like fits the mower, supports the mower, but otherwise people. <laughs> right, yeah, and stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I was, I don't want to get too, like over engineered on it i know you know we're going to have to meet floodway and all that right the um, floodway is the big one and, and so that that you get into and you get into openings and all that kind of stuff this isn't right. a perennial stream right it's intermittent i i think it is perennial I guess. is it really uh, yeah i think it is too yeah Okay. Just kind of Just crazy. A quick question. Where <laughs> yeah. where is this? This is on Hennessy Land off of Old Westboro or 60 Adams Road. Oh, you guys had yeah. photos last time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let me pull those up. Is okay. I'm also wondering, you know, um looking at the different options and so forth if maybe we could like reach out to Audubon or something, because I know they do all sorts of different installations on their sites. Okay. I'm just trying to think just because I know we're working on one of their projects, but it's for like a headquarters. So it's not like something like this, but I'm just thinking of the different Audubon locations I've been to and how some of the creative. Yep. 
this looks familiar yes yeah so um but before this washed out so severely this past fall and winter the plan was to do something like what that boy scout did at great meadow right. um we were going to have dpw do something similar or find another scout to do something similar but seeing this it's just going to keep eroding further if all we do is plop a bridge on top of it so what you'd have to the, there's no question that you have to take the culvert out uh reestablish the bank right in the stream bed but i'm thinking of something you know like going on both sides using some helical piles and some sort of pre prefab thing that it, it's a longer span but it's it's you know um the helical piles are so damn easy to put in and there's not a big footprint to that um as because it's 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 just a little skid steer going in there and doing those helical piles um and i, I i'm guessing there's certain products that you could do um where it's you know maybe the spans a little bit longer and you actually restore the um restore the bed and then it's just a little up and over like a little bridge um i don't know there's just a lot of things out there that's available for for that type of pre-made stuff and okay. kind of kits that you can do as opposed to trying to do like a concrete culvert and reestablish and have an open bottom, a totally like, I'm only talking about something that would be like 18 inches off the ground from that path. And it's just longer than you would do it. And you got, you know, I don't know, eight helical piles, four on each side. I don't know from a structural standpoint what that would look like, but I'm wondering if there's, you know, if that would be less intrusive and not cost as much. I, I think that's kind of a balancing more traditional, but if the span doesn't have to be that much, if that's an 18 inch pipe, maybe the span is six or eight feet from helical pile to helical pile. And then you do one other set as it comes down. It, it you know, it's just a, it's all a ramp up and down. It's, you know, okay. it's maybe it's a composite material. And to your point, it's not maybe a, a fire truck can't get over it, but a lawnmower will be very easy to get over it. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to think of something, uh, you know. Yeah. To your point, less engineering. And I'm thinking of the boardwalks that Audubon puts into so many of their locations. Right. And I did a boardwalk years ago on a, um, on a wetlands at a college, but that was pretty fancy. I mean, it was not cheap. It also was hundreds of feet long. Um, but I'm just trying to think of the different things that maybe we could get that wouldn't be outrageous in the in the foundation would be just simple helical piles. And, you, and do you know what I mean by helical pile? I believe so. They drive it into the ground, right? It's a screw and they screw it right into yeah. the ground. Yep. Yeah. And it's not that expensive per per one. Yeah. Okay. As long as you're staying away from, sections. yeah, yeah. As long as you're staying away from uh, a vehicular load, and if you're only doing like a you know a, a light pedestrian load at, God, you wouldn't even have to do H10, um, you know, to to kind of look at something that was really pretty simple to do. Okay. Sandy, All right. So, my only question would be if there's a culvert there can we put like you you said like a three-sided concrete culvert or something with flares on the end and then have it just be a a, a gravel uh, I, yeah i'm actually culvert, i'm actually saying no, no. don't don't put any of the um you know concrete in it you reestablish uh you reestablish the uh stream bed with with the appropriate size stones and everything and then you just slope up on each side and so you you recreate the bank, and you do that by the size of uh, you do that by you look at the stream bed upstream and downstream, and you actually measure the size of the stone. And you basically match what's up and downstream of it, and you recreate recreate that. So whenever you have a culvert like that, obviously it's constrained, and you're bringing in the opportunity for it to erode. But if it's a straight shot on both the the left and right side of this culvert. And all you're doing is letting the um, stream bed continue through that and go up and over with this kind of composite little bridge. 
then you're not doing any of that, you know, heavy construction with with concrete culverts and stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, maybe I'll take a look and see if I can find the company that we worked with before to show you a couple. And, and again, I it's been so long, I don't know what the cost is now, but we're not talking a huge long span. And, and environmentally, it's a lot better. Yeah, no, it, it makes sense. I just, I, I look at stuff like this, not this specific example, but picking a bridge or a culvert or how to kind of get in and out of a site with a, with an owner occasionally and it, I don't know it just if we could replace it with something similar in size but again if it's going to wash out in the future then why put a band-aid on it so I agree that maybe you go helicals and then you just bridge over it or something right um, especially if it's a lawnmower or you know pedestrian foot traffic right and again I mean this is and I just don't have enough knowledge and and, and you know we can, you know, talk to Jeff and stuff like that. Maybe I can try to find something for you, Leah, and say, what about something like this? It would have restrictions on it, but for foot traffic and lawnmowers, it would be fine. Okay. Um, and then the only other piece is if you can talk to DPW, how big is their lawnmower that they right. use? Right. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know that, but I can get that. Yeah. I'm just looking at a non-heavy civil approach to it is what okay. I'm trying to think of. Understood. You know. Um, that does lead to one follow-up question. So to put um to put a placeholder for the capital plan. Yep. I was gonna put a hundred K just worst case scenario. <laughs> I that... don't think that's outrageous. Okay. And hopefully that turns into 30. Okay. I that's I agree. <laughs> yeah. It, you... The helicals are pretty cost effective. You can it's get like two fifty a piece or something. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're just they're pretty easy to install, and then you can just use a skid steer. Um, the the decking and everything, the wood pricing has come down so much in the past six months that you know, again, composite. You know, whether it's a Trex product or whatever, a composite yep. product or a, or some type of wood product, um, it's come down in price. So I I agree. I think it's a hundred grand would be depending on what you need for geotech do you need geotechnical do you need an engineering do you need a plan a, a structural engineer to support what's going over that that's where you start to get into like five grand for this five grand for that yeah. so, all the soft costs yeah okay. the construction shouldn't be too bad I, maybe it's dial it again if you're trying to look at a worst case 100 grand sounds like a worst case but it could be less like 75 or 50 grand or something including some of those soft costs Okay. There's my estimating contribution. For you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> my attempt. <laughs> okay, that's that wraps up that topic. If if you guys are good with that one. So what's the next step to basically? Uh, for some reason, that? I can't hear you, Sandy. Okay, I slid off the cat. Slid my whatever. <laughs> so a lot of times, if you go with a vendor and it's a it's a prefab thing they have in-house engineering. So when you pay for the bridge, you actually get that. The geotech's kind of, you know, depending upon what they're using, helical piles, you don't specifically need to have geotech exploration um, because it goes down as far as, until it gets to a certain PSI. So it's kind of cool. Um, and again, we're not looking for vehicular loading. So that's why that's what we would have to do is that's why I said Audubon because I know they put a ton of these boardwalks in um, and they it, it you know and again it's just one of those things where I don't know I may be shocked and it's more expensive so I'll, I'll look into it and hopefully provide you with something like a, a an indication of what it could be okay so Jonathan did you have another question no I I, I'm amazed by costs regularly, Sandy. So it's, you know, it's not a- Isn't that your life? <laughs> yeah, but when people ask me how much something's going to be worth three years from now, I'm like, oh, I don't know. Oh, I, <laughs> I've, st I've stopped. I used to have a really good handle on costs for like my site stuff. I won't answer any of those questions anymore. It's real. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, I mean, and the first question, is it available? Can you even get it? I mean, they stopped manufacturing certain pipes. So yeah. it, it's like, you know, it's weird. 
or is it going to take a year and a half to get on the site? Um, yep. You know, whether it's available or not, but it, if, even if it's available, it's like you got to order it. And, you know, nonetheless, I, I'm interested to see how this goes, but let me know if you want a set of eyes to compare costs or whatever. Um, okay. I can also lean on some of my civil connections as well. Thanks. Okay. Are you guys ready to talk about 95 North Street? Sure, why not? All right. Um, so I'll have Jan pull up the plan that we have um, for the park. So going forward, we have um, basically two versions to present to CPC, which the meeting is this Thursday. Um, we have an all-in version or we have a scaled back version. Um, we're going to present both to CPC and kind of have them drive the bus forward with like if it's one or the other, or if we put two articles to town meeting. Um, so I wanted to show this to you guys. I'll just walk you through um, the features that we see here. Um, I just gotta move this out of the way. Okay, so North Street would be page right. Um, we would have the entrance to the park come in off of North Street and cross the wetlands in order to fit a larger parking area of, I believe, about seven, I think we were up to, spaces, um, including handicap accessible spaces. The maroon square um, shortly off of the parking lot would be a shade structure, aka pavilion, with some picnic tables underneath. The pink oval shortly after that would be a nature play area. Um, for kids. The white loop would be an ADA accessible trail loop, including the two orange pieces would be boardwalks over the wetlands with some educational signage. Um, the gray loop coming off of the white would just be your standard like trail in the woods kind of deal. Um, the northern curve of it wouldn't be in woods yet um, that area we would be maintaining as both um, mode meadow for playing and pollinator meadow um, for habitat purposes would have some picnic tables um, scattered throughout benches um, educational signage again once you cross over the stone wall about in the middle of the page that's the mature um, forest area so we'd have um, a loop as well as that zigzaggy cut through. Um, the reason we did that is people talked about wanting um, a place for cross country skiing in the winter. So you'd want a, a loop, you know, for regular walking, but also a little meandering thing for skiing in the winter. And then that loop comes back up and connects um, with the ADA loop up top. Um, so this is this is what we've come up with um, working with RDLA. Um, so, like I said, uh, the CPC meeting is this Thursday. We have our application before them. Um, I wanted to get any feedback from you guys and also a vote of endorsement on that application. Um, and then I just wanted to stress that, you know, should an article go forward from CPC to town meeting, it's really important for you guys to come and support it and, you know, answer questions and be part of the presentation and, and the narrative behind, you know, championing this park. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have with, I should also touch on, we've been through two um, public meetings as well as a couple of working group meetings with staff from departments like public safety, DPW, about maintenance and things. And we had over 250 responses to an online survey as well about what folks did and did not want to see here and the things that we're proposing. Um, the vast majority of people were in agreement with, as well as some of them appear right in the open space plan. Um, so. We're presenting things people have told us in many venues that they wish to see. So one quick question, Leah. Um, mm -hmm. You said, so is this the, um, is this the full proposal? And you said there's two different 
yeah. concepts. Right. Okay. So this is this would be the all in, um, the big ask, the um the scaled back version would consist of the parking area, um, the white loop ADA trail, and then um, I believe the shade structure is still in at that point. Let me just check. Yes, um, so it would stop short of the gray trail. We would still probably need to do mowing in that back field just for invasive maintenance, but without a formalized trail established back there, it probably wouldn't be like a feature of the site. Right. Is the scaled back plan significantly expected to be significantly cheaper? So the the full ask would be eight hundred and twenty eight thousand. $822. The partial scope is 657,912. So they're wow. not too far off of each other, but it's still a big difference. It's a 25% increase. Is, are those numbers from RDLA? Yes. And does that include the, is there, is there power back there or just the no shade power. structures just no power. Okay. Um, no power. And no facilities. No facilities. facilities. No. Nope. Okay. Um, What's the accessible route? Is it? You said boardwalks. Is it like a stone dust trail or something? That's the that's the idea. Yeah, stabilized stone dust. Okay. Did you say the structure is or is not there on the scaled back plan? Scaled back one includes the shade structure. So is the main difference the addition of the um, additional walking trails? Yeah, the walking trail, pollinator meadow, nature play. That would, okay, yeah. So you lose like the picnic tables over there and the, um, and the meadow piece yeah. of the back there, yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that just seems like, and does that include uh, soft costs? Yes. Okay. What is, what is the actual construction cost? Uh, let's see. I do have this in Dropbox too, if, if you guys wanted to look at it. Um, okay. Let's see. Construction. Construction of um, full scope is about 575. Construction of partial is 447. I should also note that we have flagged about, about $130,000 worth of work to be in kind from DPW. That's not included in those numbers. It's so it's reflected in the the eight two eight and the six five seven I mentioned earlier. Okay, does reflect that DPW work being done. Gotcha. How is that going to be coordinated? Um, if you hire a contractor, how are you going to split the scope? I guess we haven't worked through nuts and bolts of what that would okay. look like yet, but I, we do have a meeting on site tomorrow morning with DPW. Um, to talk through, you know, those tasks and, and the scope of them and feasibility. You know, having it several hundred thousand dollars doesn't surprise me. Having it approaching a million surprises me, but that's the, I, I just, you know, I am not in touch with what's going on with construction costs. There's also a design, I'm just pulled up the estimate. There's a design contingency of 20%, which is $115,000. So if the intent is to provide what's shown on the screen, then what's the design contingency for? The design contingency normally would be for design changes that come up during construction. So if we if we have a good understanding of the, the lot, the, the location, you know, and we don't anticipate additional costs, then that design contingency hypothetically may not be used of $115,000. I don't know if it 
it's a normal thing at this stage in the funding process to throw that in there, but that's obviously a big number. Um, the escalation of 7% for a year is, is similar to what we're seeing between six and seven. Um, and I, I would push for one contractor to do this whole project as a whole, not split it in any way. You're going to get some efficiency in that way, or you'd save money. So. Do you mean not split it with DPW? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought there was an indication of um, splitting it with another contractor. It, you may you may want to re your review. It may be cheaper to do it on the private side than the deep not nothing against DPW, but it may be cheaper to do it on the private side than DPW. Unless yeah, so it's just a bucket of money that we can use that's accounted for and it's just reducing our budget. Yeah, I mean, my question was kind of like if DPW came in and did the parking lot, right? That's a that's a confined specific thing. And then the contractor does everything else. I mean, that to me is like a scope kind of break that might work. But I'm just nervous about trying to integrate, to your point, Jonathan, integrate two, two folks doing something on the same site without a really clear, definitive kind of, you do this and we'll do the rest. And, and you guys go in and do the, um, that white loop. And then when you're all done, we'll put in the parking lot, something like that. If it's not that type of split, it's hard. So the, the items that we flagged as DPW, um, doable are like prep work. So uh, clearing, mowing, pruning, stone wall removal, and then um, woodland trail work. Yeah. That's a, it's a, always a challenge when you have someone come in and do prep work and a contractor comes in afterwards and they say, oh, yeah, this wasn't done to whatever, and we have to do this extra work. Space here for my lay down for this, or I need to do something different here, and your folks didn't do it. Um, right. It's tough. It can help, but I agree. Um, like I said, you, you may find better efficiencies with, a, with an open shop, and I don't know if jobs of this nature have to be like a prevailing wage in Massachusetts? Or... It's a town and it's large enough it's going to have to be prevailing wage. So my, you... That's my guess based on the bidding um, law um, that it would have to be prevailing wage. Right. Does everyone know what we're talking about with the prevailing wage? No. Okay. So uh, basically their prevailing wage means you have to um, generally uh, pay union rate, even if it's not a union shop, because uh, for public money has to be equal. And so, okay. it, it, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's, if you have an open shop, your, you know, price per hour to do whatever could be substantially less than what prevailing wage is. But because of the different bidding laws for public money, you can't do that. And, and I would defer to, you know, the town and what they do. Um, Almost every town I've ever dealt with did prevailing wage. I, yeah, I think it's over correct. a certain size. I think it's like yeah. 50 grand. So so this is obviously going to fall into the prevailing wage bucket. So again, maybe it's not cheaper than if I, I did a very, not a similar project, but I worked on a project at a botanical garden in central Massachusetts that shall not be named <laughs> that had similar paths and structures and, and play areas and things like that. And we ended up not doing the project because they went to open shop landscapers because it was cheaper um, for many reasons. But the prevailing wage thing certainly opens up. It may be cheaper to do it with DPW funds or DPW uh, assistance for pieces of it. Um, but again, it just needs to be clearly delegated to, to Sandy's point. Um, or else you're going to have coordination nightmare and finger pointing of I wanted this and they, I got that. So. You don't want to end up paying it twice to redo it. Yeah. And I'd also be curious if there's any other opportunities for um, grants. Yeah, we have a couple of those in mind as well. I mean, I think it's, you know, again, 
totally in support of it. It's just, I want to be a little bit realistic about when we start delving in and, and talking money. And I'm also thinking, um, presenting it and how do we present it in um, a manner that we can express the value of this property, uh, the generosity um, of this donation and why it's worth doing it. I'm just thinking of the, about those things when we go, you yeah, know, if you go in front of the town, you know, uh, and, and with what's going on in the economy today, you know, that's going to be a hard sell. So the more grant funding we can have, the more the understanding of how much value this brings, um, I think that's just going to be a challenge. That's all. So just to be clear, Leah, the reduced, the reduced option that brings it down in cost, does that eliminate the loop you said, the, the gray loop? Is that Correct. the indication? Okay. I mean, the sale might, or part of the, the sell might be that obviously that could be done at a future time. So if we establish the base park, then that loop could be done. There might be some folks in town that would want to, again, with some guidance, cut a trail through there. I don't know if that's against rules, but um, it may be cheaper than doing it with a company. You know, there's probably enough hiking enthusiasts and outdoor enthusiasts that there may be a support for an expansion down the road or additional funds, you know, that type of thing. So I agree that there should be a, like a base option and then an alternate to go further might be the sell, unless we just want to try to capture the full value, you know, off the bat. So, but I agree with Sandy, it's going to be a tough sell, especially if we're headed into a recession of any kind. So okay. in the next year, two years. So, and this, yeah. Go ahead. This would come up to vote at the town meeting is, would be the plan. So we would be um, we'll be presenting the CPC on Thursday. Right. Um, I believe they vote on which applications they want to put forth to town meeting in August. And then if they choose to put this forward, it would be at the October town meeting. Right. And so there's probably not an opportunity to kind of give the town the option of either deciding at the time, I think, probably have to choose one to look forward, correct? I, mean, I, actually, I actually think there's ways to do it because you can put in multiple uh, warrant articles and if right. one gets turned, you, you have to, it has to be strategic. Like, do you want the whole thing? You put that for it. If that doesn't pass, you have the option to, it's all, it's all thinking about the strategic approach to doing that. Um, so yeah, that, you know, there's always risks and so forth when you're doing that type of stuff and right um yeah i think a lot of people would look at it if they had the choice of the two and maybe you know default towards the cheaper one um i think once you get something in there it's less maybe less at least i would think maybe less likely to do the expansion anytime soon it, yeah, and there's a lot of things that that would play on if it becomes very successful and people uh, is highly used, there might be, you know, support for it, but it could also, yeah, it, it depends upon, yeah, uh, I certainly don't have a good grasp of the pros and cons of doing those things and whether they would truly come back sooner than later to do the other trail. Well, it, it just limits the use of the property. So if you if you have seven parking spaces, so you have seven families or, or people that are visiting this property, the, the loop itself, if you just did a walk and even if you kind of just moseyed through the trail, you could be done with that loop in 15 to 20 minutes if you really wanted to, or it could be a half an hour, 45 minutes. But what's the, do we, do we have an understanding from the folks that weighed in what they plan to do here? I, I heard co cross country skiing, but that's kind of out along the perimeter. Um, was it families weighing in? Was it people that just wanted to walk in the woods for a half hour during their lunch break or something? I mean, 
that's that might weigh into whether the smaller loop is feasible for the property. Um, yeah, there was there was a lot of support for the trail network. Um, there was also a lot of support for the open meadow for kids to play around in, um, as well as the nature play. So we figured once you're adding features that are kind of like a destination kind of thing, we need the more parking. Is there an option that has more than seven spaces or is seven spaces the max? So RDLA says that they're like, if we build what's shown now, there's potential to expand further into the site that would probably shift where the pavilion and the nature play are. But once we went ahead and already built the crossing of the wetlands is the main, you know, cost factor there. Adding on a few spaces later wouldn't be as big a deal. I'm, so, I'm just thinking of the, the, I can't remember the name of it now, right by the concrete plant on 140, there's uh, an open space that has probably four parking spots and it's normally full and that's yeah. a full network of trails all the way back behind Lake Ripple and towards right. the Lions Club and everything so I would think that this would be especially if there's features pretty heavily used so I would think that that seven spaces might get used pretty quickly especially with families and people working at home again I'd go I go walk these things on my lunch break when I can so um it may be a consideration to put in a little more parking or a stone area or something. I don't know. I just, again, I'm not trying to push it. I just, I don't, I wouldn't want to handcuff us to, to limited parking and then not have the full use of the property type of thing. Right. And so at one point we were looking at an alternative where the parking was on the other side of the wetlands and all you crossed with was as we were just talking about for Hennessy, a pedestrian type bridge, um, not a vehicular one. But in order to do that, your parking is really up close to North Street and it only fit like two spaces. And we're, we said that doesn't really work. <laughs> um, for, for what we're proposing, we didn't see that working and people that attended the meetings didn't see that working either. So. Now we're looking at this proposal with the vehicular crossing for the parking. Um, but the main thing I need from you guys tonight is just a vote to endorse the CPC application. We're still working to finalize numbers um, and, and CPC is aware of that. And I believe as long as we finalize ahead of um, their August meeting is like last, you know, as last minute as it can be, but we're still working in the background. Um, to figure out, you know, and also deferring to them a bit on what are they comfortable putting forward because it's, you know, they're the caretakers of that budget, so. I mean, I think, you know, um, from my perspective, let's keep moving forward. Uh, got a lot of effort already, um, you know, on this project, and we need to keep going. And yeah, we can, we just need to think about a lot of different things. Um, I guess to your specific question, Leah, about you want us to make a motion to endorse this plan and move ahead with it? Uh, to, yeah, endorse the application to CPC for construction of a passive recreation park. Yep. Uh, yeah, I got no problem with that. Patrick? Yeah, absolutely. Not. And Jonathan? Lost. Jonathan, <laughs> we, we missed that, what you just said. I, I said no issues. I definitely want to endorse it. I, I think it's a great idea. Yep. So c can we have a motion uh, to endorse it? A motion to uh, endorse um, submission of a passive recreation plan to the CPC. Second. Uh, roll call vote, Patrick? Yes. Jonathan? Yes. I am also a yes. So thank you, Leah, Jan, for all the work on this. Um, it'd be great if we could get it done. Um, 
and and let's try to get it done and see what we can do as far as to move it along. Sounds good. Um, the only other thing I had was if you guys wanted to talk about reorganizing at all. Um, we don't. We don't have to. We could bring back a vice chair. We could wait till all five so, are present. <laughs> yeah, and I think there's one of the things that we need to be realistic about is who's showing up on a regular basis and who's not, because um, sometimes it's not fair that it's the same folks and you know, um, and just have those conversation about attendance and stuff. So, um, and I am happy if someone wants to take over as chair, I'm more than happy to let someone have fun with that. Uh, and I do think that a vice chair would be good. So it's a designated person if I'm not around. So I'm pretty open and flexible. Um, the only other thing that maybe we might think of, and I don't know how successful this would be, is to get an alternate. So, you know, just to someone who's interested, maybe can be in the wings and so forth? I think the complication there, if, if I remember correctly, is you can have an alternate and they can help you meet quorum, but they can't vote. Right. So then we would be able to hold a meeting, but unable to vote on our permitting. Yeah. Things. And again, I, 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 I know a lot of towns have different names for different people. And I don't know all the ins and outs of that, but um, and I'll depending look into it. yeah, depending upon the town, sometimes they do it as, you know, next person up type of thing, you know. Do you Is mean alternate possible? chair or an alternate member? Alternate member. Okay, yeah. So right. we don't mess with this, <laughs> with the required quorum, you okay. know, but, you know, a vice chair would do that as far as, you know, someone to just automatically fill mm -hmm. in and stuff like that. I just have one question. With our current, well, we've got five. The quorum is three. Three. Yep. If we, is there any? And again, I'm I don't know the side of it. If we say we're opening up two additional roles on conservation commission for new members to join us as a volunteer, and we get two more townsfolk to come in and join the commission, that allows for more people to have flexibility or something. Um, does that change everything? Is that impossible? Or is that, does that change quorum to make it four or something? Yeah. Or? Yes, it does. Okay. So, so the, re the original, not a solution. <laughs> yeah. The original reason we went from seven to five is for that ex exact reason. We could always get three, but we couldn't always get four. Yeah. And, and we always had trouble filling that seventh and sometimes six and seventh, you know, yeah. positions. And I can tell you from, a state perspective in MACC, um, there's a there's a kind of a, a crisis building, and especially the the further west you go in the state, they can't fill, uh, they can't they just can't fill the um, you know volunteers to do the different boards. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of towns that are struggling to do that, and and we're extremely lucky that we have staff. And, and uh, no offense to Grafton, if we lose our staff, I quit. Uh, no, it's just, I, I don't have the capacity. And, and there are folks that are in towns that don't have staff that these folks are out doing, you know, site visits every weekend. And I don't have that capacity, none at all. And, and we're extremely lucky in this town uh, because of the staff we have, we can operate efficiently and we can do the job we're supposed to be doing. And without staff, yeah, it, it, it's just not doable in my estimation. Um, but there's a lot of towns that are, are without staff or have a part-time staff and it's really hard. So um, it's really critical. And if there are some towns that do not have enough people and it actually falls on the selectmen. Um, they mm -hmm. actually become the de facto conservation commission because they're the top and it's just the way the state's, you know, set up and, and, and how towns are set up. So it is, 
a huge problem. So I would love it if we could go to seven members and only have three as a quorum, but that doesn't work that way. Sure. So, and again, I, I, I'm totally open to trying to expand the pool of folks and, and so forth. It's just, you know, it's a challenge and we have a really good commission. We have really good people on this commission. So um, there's no ulterior motives. It's about enforcing the laws and, and regulations. And that's not true in every town. So I, can I, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate our members and I appreciate the fact you guys actually show up. Um, and, and, you know, and, and, and again, the staff is critical and they do a great job of making sure, you know, quorums and stuff. So, thank you. Yeah. No, it, hey, the fact that we have meeting minutes every, every week and none of us is doing them, you don't know how, how important that is. Yeah, and you don't know how long that takes me. <laughs> no, I get it. It's not to do it, to do it well. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, you know, um, yeah. I mean, I read through the whole meeting minutes before this meeting and, and just, you know, I try, I try to find things. I mean, I had like one question, but it had nothing to do with the minutes themselves. It had more to do about doing findings and stuff and why we, the way certain things are said for certain circumstances. That's all. It has nothing to do with what the actual minutes said. It just brought up a question, another question. Anyways, um, yeah, I mean, it's just going to get a lot harder to have people, people are busy, and, and it's it's a commitment, and and you you're doing it as a volunteer, which is why when people give us a hard time, I get a little testy, because <laughs> because it's like, dude, if you don't like it, get on a get on a got a get on a board or a committee, and, and understand you know, how important it is. And if you have civic pride and you, you believe in democracy, we are it. We are the demonstration of democracy. So uh, that's whenever my soapbox. Whenever I get in a conversation out in town or again, my son's in Cub Scouts and whatever, and they're like, oh, you're on Conscom. I'm like, yeah, come check it out. Come to a meeting, come come see what we're all about. You know, see what the things we're doing. They're like, yeah, that's all great. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, and they yeah. start to kind of slowly work their way out of the screen. It's just like, so, like, and again, some of them are on different committees or different things, right? But, you know, just like you, Sandy, you're on multiple committees and multiple commissions, and yeah, it's a lot of work. So, yeah, and, and like you know, we we uh, really uh, promote our like staff to get on it, and it's like you don't have to get on it for 20 years, but even if you go and you serve for three or five years as a professional you learn a ton i mean you always are learning and it's it's really good exposure um and you're also contributing to you know your, whatever town you live in um and you're providing a service and stuff but i don't know that's just and we do have a lot of folks that like work for niche that are on con comps and uh and you don't have and again you, it doesn't have to be a lifetime commitment but it's a great exposure especially for you know young engineers to see what's going on and, and for anyone else that's in any kind of, you know, profession or anything. So, but anything else, Leah? Nope. Okay. I think we covered enough. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. So that's what happens when you kind of delay stuff and we're on the summer schedule, but yeah. Um, so uh, everyone can make the next meeting. I actually, I was supposed to be away, but I'm not going to be. So my 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 schedule changed but you guys don't really care about that um I should be here yeah i will probably be here yeah I might be in on the cape but i could always join from the cape so. well that's just it i think um so this is so you know august 16th i was i was actually supposed to be on pto but i'm not going to be um and then i think when is september's meeting uh the 6th and the 20th thank you oh, I'm, I'm planning a vacation around that so no i actually have i have a trip out to um uh where the hell am i going oh i have a trip to dc but that's the 15th and then in october uh i'm taking uh, my sister's coming up but then i can always that's not a big deal and then I have another trip out to Chicago, which would be the 11th. 
So I think we have a copy of our meeting schedule for the year in Dropbox. Yep. So if you guys can just take a look at it for the rest of the year, and if you know any dates that you know are not working, just let us know. Because if we know ahead of time, it's way easier than yep. trying to fix yeah. it last minute. So. But what's good about it, if I'm out in Chicago for some work stuff, and as I have meetings during the day, and we have a, a you know, and we're on at seven, I can, that's easy for me to call in and participate. Okay. Um, if I'm on vacation, that's a different, right. that's different. Mm -hmm. If it's a work thing, I'm okay. But um, okay. No, just again, thanks for everyone. Um, yeah, don't anyone change or I'm quitting. <laughs> and don't leave, Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, when, when when Patrick and I are, are left to our own devices and it's you know like, what, what do we say? Are we are sure? Oh, okay, yeah, it's we struck. I'm, I'm sure we'd get better over time, but we don't want to do that. We like having you here. So. <laughs> you guys did good. We like the structure. Yeah. No. Um. Yeah. Uh, no. You guys. I think you. I, I think I have much more faith in you than you probably have in yourself. It, it, you know, you guys could do it. <laughs> figure it out <laughs> yeah you would uh, but anyways um it's nice, it's nice to have a solid team and a, and a solid crew of people and again betsy me and sick you know betsy's normally part of the crew too so yeah just and it's good i mean i like it because i trust that everyone's doing what they think is right i don't care what you think is right as long as that's what your approach is and you can have a different opinion than me i don't have a problem with it as long as that's what you think you should be doing. That's like, that's what this is all about. So um, yeah, but anyways, thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you. We need Try one to... more motion though. Oh <laughs> yes, that's the most important right motion. Uh, who wants to make that one? It already just happened and there was a second. <laughs> oh, there we go. We'll do a roll call <laughs> vote. <laughs> I heard that. Uh, Patrick. Yes. Uh, Jonathan. Yes. And I'm also a yes. So everyone enjoy the, uh, the summer that we have left and hopefully we get some rain soon. <laughs>